once again. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of technical difficulty getting started here. We couldn't get Skype working properly. And then uh, just now we had a sound loop I had to take care of real quick. You can hear that in the beginning. I apologize for that. Uh, too many windows open and too much stuff going on. We were trying to hammer it out. But uh, we got it hammered out, and uh, we are live. This is uh, Orion Rising. We are live once again. I am your host, Leonard O'Neill. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good morrow, depending on where in the world you are tuning into the show. Today, we got uh, a really good guest on here. We had him on here a while back, so you guys may not know who, you, who he is. Some of you do just because you're friends with him, because he's all over Facebook. He's on uh, many different groups. A very, very intelligent man, knows everything about everything, just about. He's like me. He goes, learns as much as he can about everything in the world, talks about it all over, talks about it all the time. We had him on here uh, a few months ago. I think I had him on when I was here with Watchers Talk. Kudos to those guys watch us talk when i was doing that show uh we had him on we talked about chemtrails and all that stuff and and uh we, we have we've been talking uh, back and forth so uh this is uh phil harris if you guys don't know who he is you guys should take a look at who he is and should go and uh, take a look at some of the work that he does all over the place and we're going to talk about some interesting stuff here today we're going to do an hour show uh but we're going because we were pressed for time he's real busy we couldn't do the two hours we wanted we couldn't do the slideshow and stuff that we wanted he had a presentation for you but we just couldn't do it um our schedules were kind of wonky and we tried to fit him in so we're going to give you guys we're going to talk about it and give you guys the tidbits to get you interested and then we're going to reschedule phil's going to come back either next week or the week after probably next week and uh we'll have we'll, we'll hopefully by then his skype's working or we'll have everything hammered out because uh we just had to go late you know 15 minutes late here 20 minutes late before we got to go on live it was all crazy he was running i was running he had doorbells ringing i had phones ringing it was crazy you know, <laughs> I even got a cat up on my chair behind me. I don't know if you can see her. She's up there on my chair. So <laughs> yeah, that, that's all right. We'll, we'll cover some good information today. So, like you said, next time I'll have everything lined up and a bunch of graphics ready for everybody. Yeah, and we'll so it'll be all we'll good, really guys. get into the, the juicy details of everything, but this will be a good overview here. And, uh, right, you know, right. We can go over a lot of stuff. Yeah, we'll be all right. We'll be all good. So, um, all right. So uh, introduce yourself to everybody, Phil, and tell them who you are and, and uh, you know where they can uh, find your information and find you. That way they know who you kind of have an idea of who you are you're not just some guy that i just grabbed off the street and said here get on the phone you know what i mean all right well my name is phil harris uh you can just type me in on facebook and i'm sure we have mutual friends and i'll just should be the first one that pops up uh, i'm basically just an independent researcher i fell into the rabbit hole of research uh four or five years ago and just started uh researching everything i could find following my intuition and anything that resonated with me and you know i like to say i'm a jack of all trades but a master of none you know I don't really like to spend too much time on one thing I try to cover a wide variety of things and see how they all connect so I, I basically just into everything um, like you said you can just type my name in on Facebook Phil Harris uh, I'm admin in uh, a lot of different esoteric groups and, and other groups and I'm in pretty much all the major groups on Facebook so I'm sure most people have seen me commenting and, and posting stuff all over the place and if you haven't i'm sure you will before too long <laughs> before too long right any group if you're in any group that has to do with like he was saying esoteric groups anything to do with alien anything to do with spirituality anything to do with like everything you know what i mean you're good if you're in any of those groups um you're gonna see phil making comments about stuff and you go oh i know that guy yeah and I've, I've got a youtube i've got a youtube channel with a lot of different documentaries and stuff i've uploaded i've mm -hmm. i've made six or seven of my own short uh, video presentations I've uploaded on there also, so um, you can type in my name on YouTube also and probably find my channel. I've got a lot of ancient history documentaries and free energy stuff and, you know, just a wide variety of, of topics I've covered on there also, so you can find me basically everywhere. Yeah, that's true. I'm not even joking. All right, so let them know. Uh, tell them, Phil, what we're going to talk about today. Let them know. Give them the idea of what we're going to uh, cover because it's kind of a big, it's kind of a big range of stuff, right? I mean, we, in, in a sense, right? Because we're going to cover a lot of yeah, history I mean, and stuff like that. I don't think we really got just one topic we're no, going to focus uh, yeah. on. I think we agreed on that we're just going to do um, symbolism yeah, and yeah. Uh, symbolism of the various ancient cultures and how yeah. it connects, and maybe just chat. Uh, you know, generically on things related to that, uh, the history right. of religions and uh, how they evolved and some of the mm -hmm. similar symbolism and, and things like that. So, um, yes, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the question that he and I were talking about, this, this is why we decided to talk about it, because a lot of people that, you know, they look at uh, all these pictures mm -hmm. in like the most famous uh, when it comes to the ancient aliens and esoteric <laughs> history around the world is that that picture of what they consider the Anunnaki. They always say it's the Anunnaki. And it's that that guy, that guy. And sometimes he has a bird face and sometimes he has a human face and he has the wings on his back and he's holding that what looks like a purse or some sort of uh, device. Device, and he's got what looks like wristwatches or some wristband, some sort of control device on his sleeve. Now, 
what, one of the things that we we talked about that people don't realize and a lot of people don't understand is you know the 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 theory of uh, uh, the, the that we always say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Now, yeah, it well, literally yeah. is. And what or you guys more. or more, what people need to understand, and this is what we're going to talk about. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about is that nowadays we have a talk show like this where we go on blah, 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 blah. And we talk, 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 or people put a blog out there and they have a website and you have all this stuff that you read on and on and on. Now they didn't have that <clears throat> back in ancient history. Okay. So what they had was they, they did cave drawings, they did pictures and everything became picturesque. Now, if you look at us humans, truthfully, the languages on this planet started with cuneiform, which was a sort of pictures because it was different, uh, you know, uh, of, of little things that they stuck in that make different symbols that went different directions. And that meant different words. Look at uh, the ancient hieroglyphics in, in Egypt, all pictorial things that meant words, Japanese language, Chinese language, pictures, pictorial writing. That means different things. You go Native Americans, same thing. There's cultures all over the planet that before they started writing words, started writing the sounds or the or the letters make up the words for the sounds, they wrote pictures because it was easier. And we here in America, especially in the North American continent, are starting to use emojis. And I do that too. I'll make a whole I sentence with just emojis. And I send it to people and laugh, you know? <clears throat> yeah. There's a there's a meme there's a meme going around like that that says uh you know, 2,000 years later, and we've went back to the old way, and we've <laughs> got a bunch of emojis up there, you know. <laughs> right. It's funny, but it's actually pretty it's true, true at the same time. Right, and then you and got you the movie of... that just came out, the emojis, right? I didn't even know about that. Yeah, yeah, there's it's an emoji movie, movie bro. <laughs> <laughs> right? Patrick Stewart from <laughs> Star Trek, who played uh, Jean-Luc Picard, he's, yeah, play, he's yeah. playing the poop. He's playing the poop emoji. <laughs> he's the voice of I'm the poop. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Yeah, yeah, he's the emoji he, he's poop. One of my, he's one of my favorite actors. Uh, right, you know, great actor. Really, so I'm definitely yeah. going to have to check that great, out. Great Shakespearean actor. A lot of people don't know that. They just know him from Star Trek. But the man was did Shakespeare did on stage. He, he, he grew up over in Europe with, uh, uh, you know, in England with uh, just the greatest up bringing an acting ability and then uh, you know ended up here in America and now he does stuff like the Strombo commercials where he's laughing the one where he's with Mark Wahlberg in the mirror you know and and uh, you know but that's for us that's for us who are fans of his to laugh at uh, things that he does and, so and then of course the X-Men movies too, and of you course know, the like, X-Men movies you know yeah, there was a scene in there I, I'm, I know I'm a little off topic but there was a scene in there when they talked to the director and uh, he made Patrick Stewart redo the exact same lines in the scene 18 times and when they were done he, Patrick Stewart said, well, was there anything wrong with the ones I did before? He said, no, I just wanted to know how many times you could deliver the same lines perfectly. He <laughs> says, so he made him do it 18 times. He, he goes, okay, wow. cut. Let's do that again from the top. Okay, cut. One more time. Okay, cut. 18 times. And he said the man was flawless. Oh, 18 times. He yeah, says he's, that, he's definitely talented for sure. Right, right. So, okay, so back on topic. So, you know, in a sense, we've kind of gone full circle where everything was, was pictures and now we're kind of coming back to that. And, and people are starting to kind of, you guys kind of get, and this is why we're talking about it, because now you guys are, are able to kind of get it. We have picked pictures. Look at the Mayans. Look at the Incans. Look at the Aztecs. Their language was pictures, right? It was all those yeah. same little faces doing different things, and they meant different things. So yeah. if you know what those are, you can interpret them. You know the, the emojis because you learn them. And then you can interpret what those emojis mean. Now, if you look back in history, it's kind of the same, only that it wasn't so obvious because we were, they weren't using emojis for uh, words. But they, when they would make their painting or their cave drawing, they would do different things specifically that if you were in the know, you could decipher it. For instance... Every time you see some sort of uh, entity that has been drawn, uh, especially in, in most of the cultures where, say, they show the wings on the back, if the wings on the back are like, you know, they're, they're the, that, that wing that does this, and this is the, the back of the person, that meant they had the ability to fly, not that they could actually fly with wings. And then when they drew angels, the wings were different. The wings were on their back, but they were outstretched like uh, a bird or an eagle, which to them meant they could fly with wings. So there was a difference in how they drew that. Now, whether the angels, truthfully, even though they were used in that one um, a style, and that style kind of stayed throughout, like the, um, the Da Vinci style, uh, sort of stayed throughout uh, for a long time, whether that was exactly that or not, we're actually not sure because it still may have been those people from the sky. But the definitive one was, if you look and you see them, like, uh, what was it, the... the um, 
the god I can't think of his name like now maybe it was uh, was that was that Bale he also had wings but they were also the fixed wings that were like that on his back that didn't mean he had butterfly wings and he could fly he had the ability to fly so that's one of the minor points and i'm sure phil's going to get into more details uh than, yeah. than i am about that so go ahead phil and and, and uh and get in because now i'm doing all the talking and we need to stop that <laughs> <when> you talk <laughs> all right well yeah just like you were just saying with the variations on the wing styles and such lately the last few months i've been getting really deep into uh uh, Middle Age and Renaissance uh, paintings, European paintings and stuff, and I've been really focusing in on the symbolism. And like you were saying, when you first look at a picture, uh, symbols and pictures are really based on your level of consciousness at the time that you're looking at them. Mm -hmm. Now, they most of the time do have one intended meaning that the original artist was meaning, but they also know that based on your current level of awareness and consciousness will be what you're able to extract from that. And the more you look at it and the more you know, the more one picture can relay. Like you said, a thousand words. Sometimes one picture you could write a whole book about a word. So, right. for instance, on some of these paintings, you have the overall theme of the whole painting that the the average person would look at and be like, oh, cool, uh, that's Helio. You know, they might know basics like that's Helios or Apollo, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, Apollo or something like that. But then right. if you start looking at the finer details, some of them have hand gestures they're doing that will mean – of various things, and mm -hmm. then uh, colors of the sashes that they're wearing might mm -hmm. mean something separate, and, you know, um, every minor little detail conveys a different message, and so once right. you know the overall arching theme of what's going on, like wings, for instance, then um, you can look at the, the pictures and see where the wings are, and we'll be able to understand what they're trying to relay once you understand the, the basic concepts right. of what wings represent in the first place, for instance. So right. symbols and pictures are really multi-layered mm -hmm. uh, graphics meant to, you know, uh, relate different things to people on different levels, basically. Right, um, like, like for instance, uh, like you were saying with the hand gestures, literally depending on where the fingers were, in what That's, position in correlation with the hand, even if I they was look just relaxed. I about that earlier today, actually. Yeah. yeah. Even where if they look relaxed, is. where each finger is meant something completely different. And if you look at the, uh, is it the Japanese or the Chinese uh, dragon, how many toes that dragon shows, if it's two, three, four, or five, means a completely different thing. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I've been over that on, on several different things. Egyptian artwork, and sometimes you'll notice that features are very like elongated or, or something that looks very strange and you think why would somebody so advanced oh, this picture is so immaculate the, the geometry is perfect and stuff why does this finger look so crazy or so long or, and stuff mm -hmm. and you, you know you start wondering well did they really have long fingers like that or what but then you know there's there's meanings yeah. for that thing you know they stylized it to yeah. relay a certain message and it's up to you you have to know what it means to be able to decode it but yeah. you know like I was saying that's what symbolism is so important for is because yeah. depending on where you're at depends on what you can get from it and right. certain certain ideas are basically un you can't even describe them with language anyway and so you have right. to draw a picture that's that's why a lot of people use pictures too because mm -hmm. you can't explain certain concepts to people um, so you have to make it into picture form, and right. plus over time languages change and alphabets and stuff. So a picture will last forever because once right. you're initiated into the mysteries or you start to know what the pictures mean, it could be five thousand years from now, and you can still pull the same meaning from that picture. But if it was written in an ancient language that's not around no more and nobody knows how to decipher it, that profound knowledge is lost forever. Right. So symbolism is really the language of the mysteries, you know, yeah. because it, it encodes all more, of the stuff into the imagery. And we're more prone to that. We're born with with, uh, with that's how we communicate in the very beginning before our uh, babies before their eyes focus as their eyes are starting to focus it's all imagery in their mind and the images are just scrambled but they're able to decipher and as they start to decipher the images everything comes into play and before they learn whatever language it is that they're born into it's all the imagery and sounds of what's going on around them. So we're, we're prone to, that's just like when you look at something, we're always trying to see a human face in everything we look at. That's it's in our DNA to recognize the human face. That's because yeah. we're supposed to recognize that. So the first thing we recognize is mommy and daddy. We recognize their face. So we're yeah, looking exactly. for these features. We're, we're 
we're born with instincts and, and genetic memories and such of what our ancestors have seen and um, and and right. pictures. You know, you, when you think of something or you're trying to recall a memory, you might close your eyes or you might look up and you're trying to reenact the the memory of the picture that you saw and stuff. So, right. you know, uh, images and pictures and symbols are really the best way or one of the best ways to to get knowledge across because, like you said, it's it's ingrained in our brains and our our memories and it's. It's part of our programming from birth. You know, a child's not going to know a language or understand stuff like that that's being spoken to them. But like you said, if they see a, a picture of a face, naturally, instinctually, they're going to know it's a mm -hmm. face. And then mm -hmm. they can also intuit, based on the body language and the facial expressions, is this a mad face? Is, you know, things sad they don't face, haven't even been face. taught yet, they will intuitively know and so symbols are a good way to access directly access the subconscious mind of the person viewing the picture to you know to right. relay a surface level at least just by looking at the picture at first and then based on how much you know and have been taught and been initiated and and such you know you can pull more meanings out of the picture and they found uh, like with the uh rosetta stone and other now other programs besides that but the rosetta stone was the first uh the first company that, that designed rosetta stone realized that's how we learn as children when we learn languages and if you think about this how you how you either if you're a parent how you've done this or if you think back when you're a child your parents did this we would hold up an object and show them show you the object and tell you what it is and that's yeah. how that's how you show the A. We'd say A, we point A, and that's how we learn. So we learn by seeing a, a symbol, uh, either a picture of what it is or the symbol itself. You would go pen, and you would yeah, know this exactly. is a pen. Now you and then you would realize that everything that looks like this that has this point that does that is a pen, and then you would show writing what it does. It's symbol, the symbolism of it. And then you say the word and you learn the word. So we, we're prone to learn symbols before words. And then we yeah, put that, words to the symbols. So, yeah, so, we're, so we're already, that's why he was saying that you could have a picture that you look at of Zeus that was, that was made of, you know, uh, 3,000 years ago. And you'll, have, you'll be able to decipher it even though some Greek person who doesn't speak English painted that picture. He's not painting in Greek. He's painting a symbol and symbols within a symbol, like we know through, throughout history, that this symbol with the hand pointing up with the key finger kind of just a little bit curved is John the Baptist. Right? And yeah. that was put in all these pictures that you see all over the place where the guy would go like this and he'd point up with a mat and it was John the Baptist. And you remember John the Baptist. I don't know who decided that, but, it, uh, but it's true, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's how you can start to... Uh uh, decipher some of these paintings and symbolism and such because once you know that that person doing that finger gesture is John the Baptist, you can look at any picture from hundreds of years of Christian artwork and you can see a person and they yeah, might be yeah. dressed different or in a different, but they might be kind of far, far the away in the picture. Yep. You can see that hand gesture and you can say, okay, that's John. And then you'll say, you can kind of decipher what the scene is about. Okay, that's John the Baptist. He's doing that. And you can almost piece together the whole picture Based, you know, uh, generically, based on knowing who that one person is, yep. all based on that one little finger gesture. So, yep. uh, you know, it's just uh, symbolism is the best way overall to relay a large amount of knowledge in in one uh, location, one image. You know, right. um, and like I was saying, going back far enough, they didn't even have language at a certain point in time. You know, when when humans first started being able to speak and their vocal cords you know that's what separates us one of the main thing that separates humans from animals and other things is you know animals can communicate in their own way but humans are able to use their mouth and their throat and their their tongue and everything to make language and, and have various languages and that's what separates us from most animals because an animal right. has their natural language they're born with or that they they know instinctively but you can't you can teach a monkey some basic words and stuff, but they're not going to learn multiple languages. You know, humans can use our mouth and our minds and our throats and everything to use language, and that's what really separates us from other other animals and stuff. But going back far enough, you know, uh, people couldn't communicate their ideas properly or whatever, and so they did the cave paintings and they started making symbols, and right. that was the best way to communicate was with symbolism and, and not just grunts and uh, noises and stuff like that. You know, as 
as their uh, language was developing, the symbolism also was developing too. So it does go hand in hand with each other also, but symbolism is much more longer lasting um, yeah. and transcends time more because, like I was saying, once you can understand what it's meaning, it doesn't matter if it's thousands of years in the future, it still relays the same message it was meant to, you know, right. on the surface layer, layer at least. So, right. yeah, symbolism is very important. And for the, the mystery teachings and, and all that stuff, it's really one of the main things that you have to learn and, and get into is symbolism and, yeah, because and it images. Doesn't, it, it doesn't change. So really quick, I want to give a shout-out because uh, I'm looking over here in the chat. And uh, and we have uh, Dino, Dino Hewlett from uh, Paranormal Into the Nights in the in the house. So kudos to him. Shout-out, Dino. Uh, those of you who don't know who Dino is, you want to take a look at his show. He's got a show called Paranormal Into the Night. He does on Fridays and Saturdays, mostly the weekends, Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sundays, and other times when he decides to. Uh, but he's got the great show. He talks about all the stuff that we talk about on here. So go and take a look at his show. And then uh, Michelle, Michelle's in the, in the house. Uh, uh, and Michelle is uh, uh, Dino's waving back over there. In the, in the thing. Michelle's in the Thanks. house. Michelle's an admin for a, a very valuable admin for many uh, very good groups. Probably a few that you're in, uh, by the way. And so she's in the house too. I just wanted to give a shout out. I'll see who else is in the house here. Uh, Kevin Cummings. Kevin, welcome. I'm gonna have Kevin on my show coming up here. When, when are you gonna be in here, Kevin? Um, I'm pretty sure I got him on here. And if I don't, we need to hammer out of time, buddy. I don't know if I've hammered out of time or not. It doesn't look like I have. Kevin, we're gonna have to hammer out of time and get you on the show here. Who else is in the house? We got a bunch of people. Some people look like some new people. Welcome to you guys who uh, found the show there. Some of you new guys who found the show. Uh, take a look at some of these other people's shows that are in the audience here because their shows are, uh, are, are a lot of times I steal their uh, people. Uh, Dino and I, we share people back and forth. I watch a show and go, Dino, I need that person. And then he'll watch a show and go, Leo, give me that person. And then we get them on the other shows and we uh, talk about all the crazy stuff that we that we see and that was going on. So I just want to give a quick shout out. So getting back to the symbols. So we're, we're predisposed. Uh, to see symbols, and so there are there are symbols in everything, and sometimes we don't even know it. Television, commercials, t movies. There's there's symbolism in everything, thing. right? And we don't sometimes we don't understand it and see it, but the director puts that stuff in. Like uh, who's who's the director? Is it really Scott? Really Scott with his white doves. Right, isn't that really Scott who does that? Yes, it is, because he has the Scott Free. Oh, I think I've seen that. Um, and there's and, and there's a there's a couple of directors. One, and I can't think of his name. He did um, he did Men in Black, uh, I think three. And I don't know if he did the first two, but in all of his movies, somewhere in the movie, there's going to be a bicycle that uh, rides two people, and two people are going to be on it, and they're going to be riding, and they're going to be completely wired up with lights. Their whole bodies and the bike, and that is a symbol that he puts in every single movie. And the other thing is the scream. Do you know what the scream is? Out there in the audience, do you guys know what the scream is? There is a scream that they call the scream, and it's one particular scream, and I can't remember the name of it because they used to have the app for it. You can look it up, and it's in every single movie and television program produced inside the United States or by any United States company. They put it in every single movie. Sometimes you see it on a commercial on television. You'll hear it, and it's one distinct scream, and it was a guy originally back in the 30s being eaten by a crocodile, and that scream has become like, you know, like the scream in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the bathroom scene with the, rah, 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 with the, you know, it's been like, it's like that, but this scream is always on in everything, and I can't think of the name of it right Right now but it's called the scream you can look it up um not the movie the scream but the actual sound effect and you get you know, i had it on my app on my phone for a while and if i still had it i would i would have played it for you and showed it to you but i don't have it anymore and it's in every single movie someplace in that movie one person is going to scream and it'll be a guy and it'll be that sound effect and sometimes they use it more than once so that kind of symbolism still is in effect today <coughs> in our modern in our modern uh lives and people don't do most of the time it goes on unseen unnoticed but guys like me and guys like phil because we're nerds, right, Phil? <laughs> we, we see this stuff and go, did you see that? Did you catch that symbolism right there? Uh, if you guys have watched and you haven't, take a look at uh, um, the, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, American Gods. Have you seen that show? The first no, I'm, season. I'm about it. Yeah, the first yeah. season's over. The first season's over, but um, the symbolism in that is immense, crazy because it's the old gods. It's it's Odin and Thor and and Loki and the old gods, and they're fighting against the new gods of America: money, greed, uh, the internet. Right. It's, and so the, there's gods, there's these new gods that are fighting these old gods. And there's a war for the human mind, for the human soul of who's going to be worshipped by by how many people. And it's fabulous. Great, great show. Real dark. 
uh, but full of symbolism. So that's just a, it's something in the modern day. I, I didn't mean to keep going, Phil. Like, I, you know, yeah, yeah, I, no, I, you're you're, fine. I want well, to show those yeah, things in the, how they, the everyday life, which is happening now around us, right? There's always symbolism and everything. Look at my book cover that you're seeing right here, right? There's symbolism there. I used Orion rising, right? Orion, the constellation is above the pyramids. I designed that book cover on purpose for that reason. You can look that up. I'm not going to get into the details of that. Those of you who know, know. Those of you who don't, look it up and find out why that is. All right, Phil, go on, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Well, like you're saying, um, it's used in movies and um, uh, advertisements and pictures for grocery stores or uh, fast food stores, all kind of right. things. Symbolism, it has a dual function. It's used for marketing and to directly interact with the subconscious of the viewer looking at it for a particular reason, usually for marketing purposes or something like that. For instance, uh, colors, you know, like... Um, Red, you know, most of us know that red is used for like bullfighting and, and stuff like that right. to anger the animals and get them riled up and stuff. Right. Well, in advertisement and stores and stuff, colors are used the same way. Uh, if an yes. advertiser wants to make the person watching it get a little bit of adrenaline pumping or get them excited for some reason and, and really drawn into it, they will use a lot of red in the advertisement or the show or whatever it is to get people yep. kind of uh, into that fight or flight mentality. It activates right. the the root chakra area or the the fight or the reptilian brain fight or flight instinct stuff like that for a particular mm -hmm. agenda. Uh, like for instance, in Walmart, you notice they use a lot of blue, and their sign is blue and stuff. Well, blue has been shown to put people. It's the feminine color, and it's a, a, a feminine energy you know it's uh it's get people relaxed and they did a study showing that when they use red in the store versus blue people were more likely to stay in the store longer with blue and spend more money because they felt more relaxed by having blue around them right. so even things like just the colors used in certain things have a big impact on the subconscious minds of the person and that's why in prisons the prison <laughs> uniforms are orange or pink and the walls inside the prisons are painted like a salmon color or or something very upbeat. They used to be gray and dingy, and uh, the morale of everybody was hostile. And they changed. They found that changing the colors. You know, back in the day, people used to wear the striped black and white. You know, when they yeah. were in prison, they did right. They really did. It was like like you saw, but that made that made them more angry. So that's why it's all orange because when you wear the orange, the orange is very uh, uplifting and very tranquil. So so the, even like he was saying, the color just the color of that dictates uh, what it is that that you're going to how you're going to react to uh, what's happening yeah. around you so, so the guys are dressed noticing. in orange right and so they're all there they're not as violent even though they still become you know they're still trying to be violent because you get too many people together and the mob rules you know the more people are packed into a smaller place and area the more the tensions rise and and that's why the police will disperse you if there's too many because otherwise people start getting feeding on each other you get angry and next thing you know there's a riot so you, all you have to do is just, just spread you out a little bit and you'll you'll simmer down uh, but that's why the, the, everything is orange so just the colors like you look at a ties <laughs> Power ties and ties in uh, uh, in business when men would dress in a suit. Like our politicians always wear either blue or black, right? They're always wearing a solid blue shirt, or they're always wearing you know a, a suit or or black. Very rarely do they do that unless they're in the center of the house. Then you see the guys kind of wearing different colors. But when they're going out, like the president's going out to speak, or the people who are running for presidency, they wear black or they wear blue. And when they're being very serious with a power tie, it's red, right? Exactly. So you got it. And see, that's that's the dual nature of the of the colors and the symbolism I'm talking about. On one level, it's meant for the people who don't know what's going on. It's meant to evoke that particular emotion or, or feeling in the people looking at it mm -hmm. for, for their agenda, what they're trying to do with, with that particular advertisement or presentation or whatever or, mm -hmm. or symbol. And for the people that do know what's going on, it helps relate to the ones in the know you know what's mm -hmm. going on and, and relay much more information to them because they do know what it's about and yep. so you don't have to explain to each person what's going on they can just if an initiate who knows what what's up can just look at it and yep. know what's going on like if you notice start looking at old uh, European paintings like I was talking about and they mostly all have these sashes that they have around them they're either usually blue red orange yellow something like that so mm -hmm. it, it not only uh, applies to the the emotions like we were talking about that it does, but it uh, conveys a certain, you know, 
idea they're trying idea. to present by using that color and what it could mean. Like, for instance, if they're using the red in the way we were talking about, it could uh, it could be symbolizing something to do with the masculine qualities of nature or reality that that picture is trying to convey about, you know, the, the uh, right brain hemisphere or the left or, you know, different kind of topics like that, all based just on the color. So right. that's just one aspect of the symbolism is the color. Uh, and then you have the hand gestures, you have the little tick marks or just, you know, so symbolism is multi-layered like an onion. You know, you can peel back each different layer depending right. on how much you know or you've been taught and get various meanings from the thing. So that's why they say a picture is worth a thousand words or more because right. you can, even just the beginner who knows nothing can look at it and, and still figure out of, what's going on. Right. Yeah, this is yeah. a cool picture. Like you were saying, Zeus earlier. If you see a picture of Zeus in a chariot on top of the picture, you know, looking down on a group of people, and all the people down low are kind of scared and looking up, you can know if you you don't know anything about symbolism or the mysteries, you can know that that's relaying that this guy up top is is somehow the ruler and he's ruling over the people, or you know, that would be like right. the surface. Okay, this is a picture of some kind of god who's ruling over these people. That would right. be. The first, here's, you know, a, like here's a perfect example of that. If you guys have ever seen the movie Amistad, Amistad was a movie with uh, with uh, Matthew I'm McConaughey. Grab a, drink. I'm grab a drink real quick. That's fine. It's a it's a movie with uh, Matthew McConaughey, and it was a true story that happened here in the United States hundreds of years ago about a about a slave ship uh, that was uh, that came came ashore in the United States. Uh, the the slaves had revolted against the uh, the masters who uh, who were taking them to sell them somewhere, and they were trying to sail back to Africa. But the the uh, Portuguese sailors who were uh, captaining in the ship <clears throat> brought them to America anyway. So they thought that the American people would be uh, more receptive to them, and then they would keep the slaves uh, as slaves. When they got here, uh, the, there was an abolitionist movement here in the United States at that time, which continued until the slaves were freed in 1865, and um, they wanted to free the slaves. So uh, in there, one of the slaves, who obviously couldn't speak any English, he was from Africa, and he only spoke the language that they spoke in Africa, he grabbed a, a book from one of the people who were praying for him. They were standing, a bunch of Christians, would stand by and they would pray for them as they walked in and would be taken from the courtroom to where their jail cell was and he grabbed a bible from one of the people <clears throat> and he said i'm not afraid of your magic but he thought it was you know their magic but he took that book and he sat down and this is the perfect example of that and you could watch this movie and see him do that he sat down he couldn't read anything but in that particular and then in that bible like most bibles up until today the all the older bibles had pictures in them of everything that was going on when they were talking about certain things there was a picture in there and he looked at the pictures and kept looking at the pictures from front to back and then went back to the front again and was looking at the pictures and one of the other guys came up to him and said you can't read that I don't know why you pretend that you're reading it and he says no I think I'm kind of figuring this thing out look and he showed him and what everything that he figured out was not too far from what we know yeah. the Bible was and he was yeah, actually that, by the end exactly of the movie how, he figured exactly out the entire Bible yeah, that's how I do my research with the paintings I've been on the last few months. You can you can read mythology and you can get a certain understanding of what's going on, but that's just the the most basic level. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at a picture or a painting uh, ancient master did on it, and you can kind of start to piece together some of the symbolism, read the myth, have the book or the the myth right there, reading it, and then look at the picture. Mm -hmm. You can get a much better idea of what's going on by combining the picture and the myth together. And, and, you know, get a better idea. And then using that intuition or what you get from those two ways, you can start to piece together the smaller details like we were talking about. Be like, okay, this myth is saying that this God overthrew this God. Right. Well, on, on this picture of that myth, this guy is wearing blue, and this guy that he's taken over is wearing red. So that would indicate something like, well, at that point in time, or this myth is about the feminine energy starting to dominate more than the masculine energy or when uh, patriarchy was falling to matriarchy and then you might see another picture of the other god uh, defeating the one who was being defeated in the last one and then right. you read the myth and you study history about different uh, eras of time like when the patriarchy was rising age of Aries and stuff like that and then you'll mm -hmm. notice that the paintings about those time periods the guy who's who's winning or defeating the other one will be wearing red sashes and there'll be a lot of red 
you know, in the, the people that are dominating that picture. So it helps you to understand what's going on by knowing the colors and, and reading the myths and studying the history of that time period so you can piece together what the symbolism, how it works, and, and how the myths are, are laid out. And that way you don't just get the exoteric or the surface level understanding. You can start to really piece together the deeper meanings of, of what's going on. Right. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted way of, of understanding, but the pictures in itself can convey all the knowledge just in the picture, but it takes you already knowing, you know, what's going on. So, right. um, you know, they're, they're see, really that, a good way to get if you, if you look at <clears throat> archaeologists and things that are going on, uh, and people are discovering things all over the world now. <clears throat> you see guys come in and they're looking at the pictures and they're kind of starting to, you know, tell you what's going on. The reason that they're able to do that is because they've already got an idea of of the time period or uh, that, you know, that is being that they're looking into. So they already have learned that certain pictures mean certain things and that and they can interpret different things that are that are happening uh, on that cave wall because they already know that time period. They've already researched that. You know, I know that I'm looking at something that is that is uh, a thousand years old because that's the way they wrote. That's the way they that's the way they drew pictures a thousand years ago, because if you look throughout time, you see that in caves that evolved and then they started putting it on rocks and that evolved. And the next thing you know, they put it on canvas. You know, they started putting on different kinds of canvas and making paintings and, and stuff like that. And so then it comes forward uh, to the Renaissance. And that was just a time when it just exploded. It exploded. Yeah. The whole sim symbolism in, in uh, paintings or in visuals just exploded at that time period because people were able to experience and they were able to express themselves more freely like now where we have a lot more freedoms to be able to express ourselves with art and things like that. So they were able to do that. And then they did it in music too. And a lot of people don't realize that. Like Mozart oh, yeah. and these guys, right? There was a lot of that going on in music where um, the, if you listen to what their, what their journey is that they're trying to take you on – in music and then you look at what the name is of what they called it or just let it let it let it flow and take you you'll realize that there was a lot of symbolism in the things that they did there too yeah, exactly right and that one's a little more complicated because of music theory so that's a little far more complicated than than just pictures and what you see visually but once you learn and you start getting into that then you start to realize uh, and appreciate these other things that that you don't notice and that you wouldn't notice until you started learning things and then realize that music plays a, a very strong role in our life lives as well am i right yeah and, it, and it's the same basic idea with the music is that you can listen to a piece and know nothing about music whatsoever or not even the name of the piece or nothing about um you know the music symbols or anything you get a feeling based on the sound that you're listening to if you get a real heavy fast repetitive motions you know you can actually feel your adrenaline building up listening to a very strong piece of music right and you basically have a story played out in your mind just by listening to a great classical piece. It'll raise you up and bring you down, and then it'll be real cool and calm and nature sounds and whatever. You know, they can combine different types of noises and, and frequencies and stuff to give you a feeling and take you on a journey in your mind and your heart just by the, the music alone and by the emotions you get from it. That's the same thing with the pictures. You know, it all is working on your subconscious mind and your emotions and the, the feelings you get from hearing the piece or seeing the piece or, or whatever. So symbolism, music, all of that is, is a, you know, really a way of interacting with you on a level that you can't even really explain mostly. You have to experience it instead right. of just being told. You know, you can't, you could be told how beautiful a sunset is on the beach in Hawaii, but until you go there and see it, you know, you can't really get that feeling of it. Same right. thing with a, a myth or something like that. You can you can read the myth and kind of understand what's going on, but then if you see a picture of what's going on and, and the artist was really good and depicted that mythology properly and used good colors and was really good artist, you can see it after you've read the myth and you can be like, boom, it, it goes straight into your mind and a thousand words enter your mind at the time you're seeing the picture when it would take somebody you know, uh, uh, hour to explain what's going on in the picture, and then they would also right. be able to have to speak very good English, know how you think to cater the way they talk to you, so you'll right. understand it, know about your past life experiences and how you respond to things, so they can cater the way they're explaining it to you. You know, there, there's so many different ways they would have to. Every person is different on how they understand things, so the picture you know, is a good way to get through to everybody on a fundamental level 
mm-hmm. striking that instinctual nature that everybody has by just the way the picture or the symbol is set up. So that's, you know, the generic use of symbolism is interacting with the subconscious mind and the emotions of the person who's looking at it and relaying a message without explaining it. You know, even an old cave painting of, you know, a a person throwing a spear at an animal, you know just by looking at it that hunting was very important to these people. These people, you know, they would had all the space to draw and they knew how to write and draw and stuff, but they drew a picture of hunting, so that was very important to them, you know, and things like that. So the picture explains to you what was going on in those people's lives and what was important to them by the imagery. And then right. going a little bit, going a little bit deeper even, you know, some people say that cave paintings and very old artwork and stuff like that was actually being used as a form of like divination because, you know, um, like doing magic and, and manifestation and divination and stuff, whatever you put out or you put your energy into is what you're going to get back. So they say a lot of these people doing the cave paintings of, of drawing hunts and stuff were doing that not only because it's what they knew and what was important to them, but also because by them focusing their, their focusing their energy on it and painting it and imagining a successful hunt, it might give them luck in the hunt they're about to go in on. And it, it right. boosts their morale and it also <clears throat> manifests you know, the event they want to occur. So it, it's... That kind of explains a little bit of how it's deeper. It's got different levels to it. One is just because it was what they knew. They were hunters, and it was important to them. But also because it was, you know, it had deeper uses also, magical uses, and uh, to boost the morale of the people looking at it and stuff like that. Well, and <clears throat> we've found now, we know now that imagery like that, positive affirmation, positive energy, uh, works. And we know that, that they've done studies. I've, I've read studies where they, they've taken like, uh, you know, 15, 20 people uh, and, or, you know, two different groups, 30 people, split them into 15 each, and then said, okay, the, you guys over here take a basketball and I want you to practice for one hour a day shooting that basketball into the basket. And you have to do that every single day for one hour. We want to do that for 30 days. Then you people over over here, I don't want you to take a basketball or touch a basketball and shoot it into hoops, but I want you to sit down for one hour a day, close your eyes, and see yourself shooting a basketball into the hoop over and over again and practicing for one hour a day. And at the end of 30 days, they brought the people back and they tested them to see who was better at shooting the hoops, the people who actually did it or the people who visualized and they found that it was identical. That they learned oh, really? the same, yeah, they learned the same amount, whether or not they were actually shooting the hoop, the ball in there, or if they were imagining themselves doing it. But they had to have actually done it before so that they could actually imagine themselves doing it. But the improvement was the same. The only difference was the physical improvement wasn't as much. Because, you know, like if you dribble a ball long enough, you're going to get the muscles from dribbling that ball yeah, yeah. long enough. So, <clears throat> so, the, so the body didn't, didn't learn, didn't build up the muscle tissue it needed, but it did learn the eye-hand coordination and, and, the, and the muscle memory. To yeah. be able and to it, shoot and, the hoops. Isn't that crazy? And it's actually possible, too, that if they would have did a little bit deeper study and actually looked at the muscles and, and, and measured them beforehand, actually thinking about they it might have would. even made the muscles do it because, you know, right. there's a, some new science. Bruce Lipton has right. this new science. Well, it's not very new now. It's a few years old, but it's called epigenetics, the power of intent, the power of belief placebo effect, things like that. Simply by believing or focusing your attention on something, your body or your mind or whatever can actually manifest or create that event. So if you imagine yourself, you know, working out all day long or something, you know, if you actually measured your muscle mass before and after, it might only be a, a very, it might just be a very slight increase, but simply by focusing and imagining you're doing the thing can actually create the thing itself. And you could actually lose body fat by focusing on losing body fat you can right. gain muscle by you know doing it or right. imagining you've done like you said imagining that you're shooting basketballs for hours a day and you might get better at shooting basketball right so you know that well, see, and I took that to heart and anybody who knows me knows that I've been in the martial arts like my entire life and I took that to heart because I believe that that the martial arts was an art it was an art form I, I thoroughly believe that um, I, I got very deeply into um, the you know the the Japanese Korean Asian 
ideology of of the mental discipline the physical discipline and the higher soul of martial arts not just something that i would use to fight somebody and beat somebody up so oh, yeah. I, I i really went down that rabbit hole of uh, you know almost becoming like a you know uh, like a samurai i really went down that rabbit hole of of you know like that if you guys have ever watched that movie uh, uh what was it uh the slumdog samurai or something like that it was a forest whitaker anybody knows it's uh, he was a hitman but he he literally was living the life of a samurai even though he was a black man in chicago but he lived by the samurai code by the bushido code so i was not quite as far as the bushido code but very close and i believe that it was an art and i was raised and to believe that uh you fight only in self-defense you don't look for a fight but you know but you take care you defend yourself and it was an art form and then i then i then i found out about this this you know using your mind as well as using your physical body to learn these things and i literally would project myself doing the moves and thinking of speed and rapid speed to get faster to be able to do the moves faster because in martial arts if you're if you're fast and you're you're gonna and you're accurate you're gonna win you have to be fast accurate yeah. lucky and you have to have a heart a thick skull but you know unless you're like if you're in, in a, especially if you're doing like now with mma where they're trying to beat on your head uh you know but um, it worked. I was actually, and still I'm actually pretty fast handed for, I'm going to be 50 in, in uh, two weeks. And, you know, you still get those reflexes that, um, that you don't realize are there. And it's in it. And every now and then there's a, there's things where they show that kind of stuff where in a physical way, there are those key signs for people that they use. And those who are in the know understand. And here's a perfect example, really quick. And then I'll let you speak in the movie Ronin. Did you guys see the movie Ronin? Um, De Niro was in a movie called Ronin. <clears throat> and Ronin actually means, this is a Japanese word that means, that means uh, a masterless samurai. Uh, and when your samurai die, or when the master dies, the samurai who were under him no longer have a master. And so they, they can't just go and get some other master. So they're, they're what's called a Ronin, which is a masterless samurai. And they're, they're supposed to just wander uh, until they die. But they're also very, you know, people look at them because they're, they're, they were samurai. So in this movie, they were Ronin. He was name was Ronin, but the movie was called Ronin because they were all hitmen who did not have a master and they came from different countries and they were hired by somebody to do a job. Okay. And, uh, he, he was called Ronan cause he was the, the main character was called Ronan and he was an American and he used to work for the CIA and he was, and he was burned by the CIA. So now he's a hitman without a master. And, uh, in the movie, he's trying to figure out this guy who's in a wheelchair and he sets up this desk and he puts everything in line in the desk. So it's all touching each other. And on the other end of the desk is a coffee cup with coffee in it. And as he's talking to the guy, he leans forward. And when he leans forward, he pushes one thing and it slides everything slowly towards the guy on the other side. And he's talking and he kind of does this one last little shove as he talks and he kind of moves. And when he does, he shoves it and the coffee cup falls off, falls off the edge. And the guy instinctively reaches down and catches the coffee cup without dropping a a drop of coffee out of it, sets it on the table, looks at Ronan, smiles and goes, old habits. Another, (laughs) Another example is in the movie, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. When and he did this on purpose, Brad Pitt's character is going to pour some wine for for Angelina Jolie. He pours the wine and then he holds it up, looks at her and drops the wine bottle. And instinctively, she reaches out and catches the wine bottle. He looks at her. Right. He looks at her. She looks at him. They both know in that instant. So she drops the wine. And acts like she didn't catch it. And that's when the battle ensues. They try to kill each other. <clears throat> now, that was the symbolism for those who were in the know and the two of them that they were both hitmen. And that's where yeah. that's where in that movie with Ronan, he was testing this guy to see who's this guy. Is he just some chump? And, and it turns out the guy went, whoosh, caught the coffee cup, and not a drop spilled and looked at him with old habits because he had the reflexes. So, mm-hmm. so that's the symbolism that is in our bodies that is the muscle memory that you do automatically. And it's the same. So I know it was a little off the track, but the more you're repetitive in your mind, the more you're repetitive in doing the muscle memory. That's why the military does the drilling into your head in basics so over and over and over and over. Because in combat, when you're freaked out and you're scared to death, you're going to do what you were taught. And so you automatically start to do it. So that's, that's yeah. the physical part of that. So go ahead. I'm sorry, buddy. Oh, yeah. I don't even know where we were at, but I mean, it, it all ties together. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, right. 
Yeah, I mean, is there, is there anything in particular about symbolism or history or religion or anything that you want to get into well, or discuss? You know, or? Uh, you know, if you look at, here's some more examples. If you look at, like, okay, say the movie or the book, The Da Vinci Code, and the stuff that Leonardo da Vinci did in real life, that whole thing was based on theories of people who have looked at the symbolism that is involved in all these paintings uh, going back to, uh, you know, Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ and the story of Jesus and whether or not he was married to Mary Magdalene and whether or not they had children. I read all the same books that Dan Brown read that he based his story on. I know that because I read all the books and, and I know what he based his story on because of what he did. And there was things uh, in his movie like uh, the names of characters in his in his movie, like like that one guy, what was his name? Teabing, um, who was played by the guy I can't think of his name right now, who played Gandalf in the in the uh, Lord of the Ring movies. Um, his his name was an anagram for one of the authors of one of the books that I read. Um, so he did stuff like that in his in his movie and in his book to show those people who are in the know what books he based his theory on. <clears throat> yeah. And he took that and said, "What if these guys' books were true?" What if that really happened? And then he wrote a what if story. I did the same thing with Orion Rising. I took all of this ancient aliens ideology throughout history, everything from the, the television show, Ancient Aliens, everything that was in all the UFO shows, the MUFON ideologies, everything that I've learned in my life and said, what if it's all true? And I took all of that information and I wrote a what if story of what if it really was happening or is happening exactly the way our theory thinks that aliens were here, aliens are here, shadow government, people learning about it, and what do you do about it? So that's book one of a trilogy, or maybe even more books than that. It's, it's going to be a series that is that story, just like Dan Brown did. I did a what if. What if there really is all this stuff going on? And there's a lot of symbolism in that as well. And that's why I bring that up, not just because I'm trying to sell the book, because, you know, I plug myself, I plug the book. Come on, that's what you got to do. But <clears throat> that's another example. So in, in the history, if you look at the paintings that were drawn, and they talk about this in Ancient Aliens, where you see pictures of, uh, you know, where it's, what's the most famous one? Where it's Mary Magdalene, and she's sitting inside the room, and she has her hand down like this, and there's an alien spaceship outside, and then it has that laser beam that goes down, and it goes right into her head, right? Like it's implanting thoughts in her head, right? Now, if you look, you can't say, oh, that's just a bird, you can't say, you know, oh, that's a bird, that's a plane, wait, it's Superman. It's a freaking flying saucer, man. <laughs> Am I right? It, it, definitely looks, it definitely looks like one. I've, I've like found uh, very high-quality images of that, and I've zoomed up on it. And when you get very, very close, you can speculate on it being something else. But, I mean, it, it definitely does look like it could be some type of flying craft. Now, when you start studying a lot of other symbolism and paintings from the same era, right. you see things that are somewhat similar that are more like openings in the sky where light is coming in and stuff like that, you know, so it, it may or may not be, but it's, it's always better in my philosophy of research to stay open-minded about everything and pursue all the avenues and never say something is impossible and immediately just discredit things. It's always best to say, okay, yes, that's possible. Let me incorporate that into my worldview and then seek to, disprove it and also find supporting evidence too and by doing that when you immediately dismiss something just because you don't know it yet or it seems impossible you'll never get to the core and, and really learn anything and, and awaken or ascend or whatever you want to call it because mm -hmm. that's like rule number one of the mystery schools or of research or anything is that you have to forget everything you know and yes. just yes. go based on what mainstream science has taught you or where society is at at this point, you know, because every few years everything we know changes, new discoveries are made and, and uh, you know, in a lot of aspects the ancients were much more advanced than we are uh, in yes. many aspects. And yes. they had technologies and knowledge about nature and reality that we're just now discovering or yep. still don't know about. Right. Well, see, and a lot of and, people don't think they all think that we're the most intelligent now. And that no one, everyone back then were a bunch of cave dwellers running around in animal skins, you know, and, but it's not true. <laughs> Am I right? It's not true. Yeah, not true. Now, the same, the same, I talk about this all the time, and this is what people don't seem to understand is even right now on the planet, you got some places where people are very intelligent and sophisticated in Silicon Valley. You got supercomputers, 
but you still got the tribal villages in South America. Right. So, I mean, just because one group of people is primitive doesn't mean the whole world is like that. So people seem to think that in ancient times, because there were primitive people, that everybody must have. But it's, it's the same way it is now through all of history. There's always been an elite class of people, royal class, priest class, people with very advanced knowledge. They just mainly kept it secret and inside of their mystery schools and, and stuff. And, right. you know, so most people think that everybody was primitive, but the truth is is that the, the elite class, going as far back as our history goes, in many ways we're more advanced than we are now, technologically, spiritually, everything. You know, yeah. um, I mean... In my idea, it's just it's a fact that there were advanced civilizations long time ago. I mean, there's just I've done so much research to where I'm way past the point of saying, well, maybe I don't know. There was advanced civilizations long ago, and there's many ways to prove it. Even just by the artwork and and stuff and the carvings that we find from the first dynasties, right. there's no way that it's just impossible. There's no way that primitive tools could have done some of that stuff. So right, you don't have to. And a lot of people get on these illogical train of thoughts, too, saying, well, if you're saying they were advanced, that must mean you're saying they had all this laser, which they might have or might not. But just saying somebody was a little bit more advanced than science is saying doesn't mean that we have to say that they were uh, god beings and had right. you know armor suits and this and that. I mean, they were right. obviously more advanced than we're told, but the level of it advanced technologies is what we're all trying to figure out and reconstruct and all that. So, I mean, people right. need and, to... And to further they, that, I, and to further that, it, you know, they, they, everybody hears the argument that I always get. If they had all these tools, they would, we would have found them. They'd have been laying around. And, and this is what I say to that, and I tell them, that's not exactly true. Has anybody taken a look at any of the areas around Chernobyl that was abandoned by us? The, those areas are almost completely gone now off the face of the earth because it's been overgrown. But there's no tools yeah. laying around. There's no tools laying around. When you go there, you couldn't you couldn't prove how we built the buildings that are there because there's no hammers, there's no drills, there's no machinery that cut the yeah. wood. There, there's a, None of that stuff is there. Yeah. There's a few different reasons for that too. For one, uh, I watched a show a while back called After Humans. I think it was called. Yes. It was on the Discovery Channel or something. Yes. It was showing you how if all humans were gone and technology just ceased, how long it would take before you couldn't even tell humans were around no more. Right, right. So even, even just nature taking over and steel rusting and uh, jungles growing over things would, would cover 90% of all signs of life after 100 to 1,000 years. You and wouldn't sometimes even really, quicker, sometimes even 20 years. Yeah, sometimes years. much quicker. But yeah. even you know after 100 to 1,000 years, you really, just because of growth, jungle growth and, and rust and degradation and entropy and stuff like that, you yep. wouldn't be able to see hardly anything anyway. Yep. Now, the other yep. part of it is that a lot of advanced technology it doesn't have to be like we would consider advanced now where there will be devices and tools. Advanced, right. a lot of times, can mean very, very simple <clears throat> things that can achieve great feats, like, right. for instance, acoustic levitation or yeah. um, electromagnetic right. levitation or something. Yeah. If you can learn how to chant, let's say you can get 20 monks and learn how to chant and lift a 1,000-pound block, and when the people die, when the people die, your technology is gone. Right. You know what I mean? So you wouldn't find those things if it's a very easy but advanced method of doing these things. So right. it advanced uh, methods does not have to mean huge cranes and laser devices and saws, which I think some people did have those things also, but yeah, yeah. a lot of the advanced technologies that were used back then were actually very uh, based on nature and, and sound and frequencies yes. and stuff that where you don't need tools and devices. It was right. just using what uh, what's already time. there. There's, there, you know, there's theories of like Atlantis and just the people that were there and the people that are on high Brazil, uh, which is now also underwater, that they used crystals and they used the energy in crystals to do things, including flying around the earth. And, they, and this is not just one you know, uh, nation telling the story like Atlantis was told by the Greeks. But this isn't or it was Homer, I think. Uh, was it Homer or was the Greeks? I think it was Homer. So he was Plato. a Roman, but he got the story from the Greeks. So the, Plato. Uh, uh, Plato was the so, Plato. so it was Plato. So it was the Greeks. I and think then others mentioned things too, but Plato's the, the, but main, he's the main one. So 
so those those storylines came from one group, but there's other stories just that are similar to that. The Celts, for instance, that that were that were north over there, they talked about high Brazil, and so did the Vikings in the folklore from from Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland about these people who lived out there, and they also used crystals and and things, and they were they were considering them like gods because they were so much more advanced than them. <clears throat> so that doesn't necessarily mean that they were. It just means that they had a different kind of technology than we had. So so what what happens is most people try to apply today and who we are to everything. And that's one of the things I learned in basic philosophy. Philosophy 101 is to, to learn and understand a, a culture and what they were talking about, a philosopher that said something. You have to learn what was in his mind and what was his mindset of that day. So you have to unlearn. This goes back to what Phil was talking about. You have to unlearn everything that you know because you have to learn what was happening in that time period, what, what possessed him or what gave him the drive to write what he did in the manner he did. Like when Friedrich Nietzsche said, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, right? So <clears throat> these are the symbols. It's the symbol. Symbolism is the same way. You have to unlearn what you know and forget it and don't try to apply it to you now. Don't try to apply it to the way we would draw something or the way we would sell because I'm an author. I have to use words <clears throat> to make you understand my story. So I have to use words that in your mind I know will paint a picture in your mind that will become the movie of what's what you're reading in your mind for you to visualize it that's my symbolism is the words and the way i put my words together to do that and all authors have to do that so we have a certain way of writing books that has a certain harmonic like a sound like a wave like a song while we're writing so that the words flow while you're saying them so that so that it flows right so your brain then picks up on those words and puts a picture there and every time you read a word another screen flips over another image flips over in your brain and pretty soon it's going and there's a movie that's what i do and that's what they did but they didn't have many many words to do that so they used the symbols so that the more you looked and the more you knew, like he was saying, the more educated you were, know you were, the more you would recognize what was going on, and the more yeah. you could tell the story of what was going on. That's how that ties in, am I right? Yeah, and it's a way to preserve it through you know long periods of time yep. by using the same symbolism and and by passing this knowledge down. You know, like I was saying, languages change and this mm-hmm. and that. Like if you're a, a mystery school initiate that speaks English or one that uh, is from uh, Japanese or something, and you didn't know each other's language, you wouldn't be able to talk to each other and, and have a philo- philosophical conversation about right. mystery teachings. But right. if you had a picture that both of you had been taught about and you both knew the symbolism, you could lay the picture down, and without even knowing their language, you could point to the spot and you could kind of make facial expressions or show, you know, you could just lay a picture out or you could draw a picture and they would know exactly what you're talking about. Right. You know, so that's and, how symbolism that's transcends why, language. And that's why sign language works. Right? For those yeah. of you who know, that's yeah. why sign language works. Because there's only, there's like four kinds of sign language on the planet. And there's, so there's the American sign language and there's European sign language. And then there's the world sign language. And then a couple other countries have theirs. But that's why sign language works because it's symbols. We don't have the sound. Right. So I can't see, but I, can, I can't hear, but I can see. So then I take every word and put it into... Yeah, yeah, right. and some and part of sign language is um, what somebody chose to say one thing means, what one hand gesture means, but also part of it is based on natural human body language too. You yes. know, body language itself is symbolism. Yes, in the same way of you being able to intuitively look at pictures and draw information out of it is the same thing about looking at a person's body language and being able to extract information. Symbolism is basically about being able to raise your awareness level and your intuition level and being able to learn how to extract more information from what you're seeing, you know, uh, by knowing these things. You know, body yeah. you learn to read body language and you can extract, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, he can look at a, a, a scene right. or a person or little details and get a picture in his mind of a whole story of what happened because he's trained himself, or he naturally somewhat, but he's also trained himself to look for these things. Right. You know, like and the, so uh, the TV show Psych was based on the same thing, where and it was that was literally based on the same ideology, where his father was a cop and his father taught him what to look for and how to see these things. And Monk, the TV show, because he was very OCD, he would catch everything. 
And so he would always see stuff that was going on. And the same thing, he was trained and understood the symbols and the symbolism of what was going on in that scene. And that's part of the forensic science and it's part of profiling. And the police department teaches you to look for, to be able to decipher the scene, to be able to find out who the bad guy is and how to catch the bad guy. And it's all being able to read that picture of what you see. But now it's a 3D picture. Right now it's literally a 3D picture that you're standing in or 4D because you're standing in it and you have to look around the room, uh, a murder scene, say, and read what you see, read what this picture is telling you. Right. Yeah, that's how you catch it. So they have to learn how to do that. And that's what their trade is. Their trade is to learn that. And then the forensic guys come in and they get right down to the, you know, to the subatomic level and read that room and then they go back and report to the other guys and they get together with what they learned and they can they extrapolate out from there and go this is the guy and that's how they recognize uh a, a modus operandi right yeah Which is mod yeah exactly right that's how and that's they, the same yeah go ahead go ahead yeah well that that's the same uh, basic way that the symbolism works too is that you got these various layers to it and then depending on how much you dive into it and how much you can extract you can eventually pull out the core meaning of it, you know, by going through these layers and getting deeper and deeper. It works the same as like you were talking about a crime scene investigation. You know, you can, if you're a rookie and you just get there and you've never done an investigation, you're going to look and say, okay, there's a knife laying there, there's a dead body, somebody was stabbed with a knife, that's all I know, you know, but a a seasoned... Yeah, a seasoned detective, or if you have somebody there training you, will say, okay, well, let's go examine that knife a little bit closer. Um, you know, there's a blood stain here on the bottom that wouldn't have got there, so the guy who stabbed him also got hurt, too. Or You know what I mean? You can start right. to get these added details, or, uh, you know, there's a blood spatter here, but not but here. But not there, you know? and there should be one here, which means something yeah. was blocking that area, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's depending on how much you look into it, how much you know, and it's that's why the mystery schools or the initiation, you know, however you want to say it, uses symbolism to help expand people's awareness and, and consciousness by using symbolism, by teaching you how to dig deeper into it and extract more information out of a picture. And by doing that step by step along the way, your consciousness and your ability to perceive situations and uh, pull out truths of reality or whatever become expanded at the same time. So symbolism is a great way to help uh, initiate and guide people to higher levels because as you, you know, can read more, you become much more intuitive. And after you learn how to read symbolism or a picture, you can apply that to everywhere. Somebody who's never done a crime scene investigation, if all you do is study symbolism and paintings and you finally learn how to look at a painting you've never seen before and get most of all the meanings out of that, you could start going to work as a crime scene investigator and be ten times better all naturally already than a rookie cop would be who's never done any of that stuff because now you know how to dig deeper and and look for details and stuff like that. So, you know, symbolism is a great way to apply to every aspect of of life and reality to find out deeper things. And that's still and, only, only using sometimes that's a drawback and that and that goes that goes to uh, uh, you know another philosopher that said ignorance is bliss because sometimes that's a drawback because as uh, being a writer I've been a writer my whole life um, a, a buddy of mine who was also a writer he and I used to go to the movies together and we'd watch a movie and <clears throat> We would be able to figure out what was happening in the movie and obvious things that the director would show you that um, those of us who are in the know would see like there was a scene in in the movie. uh, We went to see The Sixth Day and that was the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger where they were cloning people. And towards the end of the movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his clone are going to get the bad guys and uh, Schwarzenegger walks around the corner and he looks over and the camera pans to this big, huge tank of gas and then pans back and he walks away and Mike looks at me and he goes, gee, I bet we will be seeing that later on in the program. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, later he used that to blow it up and kill one of the guys who was trying to kill him. Those were one of those things that the director put in there visually so that you knew it was there. Even if you weren't paying attention, subconsciously you knew it was there. So later when it blew up, you went, oh yeah, he walked right past that earlier. 
Yeah, See, those, yeah. So those are the symbolisms that the director shows and that the writer shows to walk you through things so that you see things uh, uh, that you don't know are there. And then later yeah. you realize, oh, wow, they introduced that already. And I didn't even notice yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. See, and like you said, it can, it can be a drawback, I guess, sometimes because it's no fun anymore. Because you're going you, yawn, right? Yeah, this is like somebody asked the, the question. Off, off. Somebody asked the question about about uh, uh, Stephen King. What kind of nightmares do you think he has? I'll bet he doesn't have any because he's going, is that it? That's all you got? I would have wrote that better. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, and once once you get to these levels where you can do this stuff, there's no going back, you know. Nope. So yeah. that, that's a, a big part of all this stuff too is that, you know, you once you dive in deep and you start learning all this stuff and you're initiated and you reach these levels or whatever, you, you know, you, you can't go back. And so – yeah. You, sometimes you look Listen, at people and, and that was what the Da Vinci Code, the book and the movie was based on was the guys who saw that stuff and looked at it. And you see that in the movie where they talk about it in the movie and he shows you the images of the Last Supper and he starts to break down the Last Supper. That's true. All the stuff that he says in there is what is real theory of real people about the difference of the feminine and the masculine and how everybody thinks that that's Peter. And in fact, it's not. It's Mary Magdalene. And, you know, and, and, and all of that he says in there is true. There's even a guy doing this. You know, in there with the John the Baptist hand, there's another one with this, with the neck, and there's all the symbolism that was put into that Last Supper. There is no chalice on the on the table. There are no drinks on the table on the actual official yeah. painting of the Last Supper. So how did he drink and say, drink of my blood when there was nothing on the table? Right. But yeah. in reality, there was because they had drink and he said, drink and everyone drink and it's, you know, and then everyone eat of my uh, flesh. So he did that in reality. But when they painted the fresco, yeah, exactly. it wasn't in there. So there was a yeah. statement being made that John Ooh. the Baptist, because they believed some people who were Baptists believed John the Baptist was the savior, not Jesus Christ. Yeah, so that that's what I was saying about you can read a story or read the Bible or whatever and you can you can get one level of things but then you can look at artist interpretations of it and they may be initiated or they may know these deeper meanings to the the original story and convey them in their artworks mm -hmm. to add extra details or to give you deeper details of what was originally meant. You know, uh, so you can use both ways to get the full meaning of what's going on. You know, right. but if you just read the story alone, uh, now if you already knew and you had been told and you've been through all this stuff, you could read the story and you would be able to extract the deeper meanings. But if you're just getting into it and stuff, you know, you can, you have to use the symbolism and the text, and you know, both at the same time to be able to kind of piece together what's going on and learn how to read deeper into things and, right. and find out stuff that's not on the surface level things like you just said they're not being a chalice on the table most people would not even pay attention to that detail but once you first see that make that realization hey there's no drink there what's going on okay this must be something deeper than just yeah, right a picture of what's in the bible you know this guy's trying to tell me something and then yeah. once you piece it together one picture can describe a million things. You know, well, there's so much. Look at that, just pictures. that picture alone. Nobody really seems to be having a good time in that picture. <laughs> if you looked at it, nobody is happy. Yeah, okay. Nobody's having fun. Everybody in that picture is arguing with somebody else or they're in fear or some people are angry. There's, yeah, there's, you yeah. know, there's no one. The only person in there who seems tranquil at all is Jesus in yeah. that, in that fresco, in that picture, in that painting. That's the official, you know, uh, the official painting that everybody has seen. But you don't, yeah, you don't, because you assume things. And that's why he asked her, how, how, how many chalices are on the table? How many drink cups are on the table? And she said, <clears throat> I don't know, one? And she, he, he said, look again, there was none. She was like, wow. Yeah. You know, so yeah. those things are true. Those theories are true. And that's what Dan Brown, he didn't make the theories up. He read them in other books that other people had written throughout time. And those books were written from other books that go further yeah, there's, back. There's a lot more, there's a lot more truth to some of these books like Dan Brown stuff that yeah. most people who don't know would just be like, oh, this is a cool new way it's of cool thinking. Way but, they still think, up, yeah. but still think, they still think that it's just fiction or made up or, right. you know, they're like uh, uh, a mainstream Christian would probably get offended by it by saying, oh, he's a uh, heresy on the, you know, that's not what it meant or whatever. Right. But the right. initiates and the people who are in the know can figure out what's going on and find out what was originally intended in these things. Like that Last Supper painting, there's so many details, you know, like you were saying how it's actually Mary in it, you know, that and the, the hand gestures and stuff, 
and that might tie into bloodline symbolism and things like that. That's right. even only just one level. Then you right. got extra. Then you got extra levels to it, such as a lot of people say that that's actually an astrological painting too, to where each um, each disciple or apostle or whatever represents a zodiac sign or a a month of the year. You know, you'll notice that there's 12 people around the table, and uh, they're divided into sections of three. Right. which would be the seasons and stuff. So, you know, I'm not saying that is definitely what it is or what it's not, but there is multiple layers multiple of interpretation layers. to yep. symbolism. And even if you find out 50 layers and not all of them are right, even just by learning how to decode different uh, layers and look deeper into things, that gives you the knowledge and the abilities you need to start you know, deciphering other things and applying that to your daily life and how you look at reality and stuff like that, you know. So there's yeah. there's a lot more encoded into symbolism. Like I was saying earlier, it really is like an onion. It's got all these different layers you peel back. And like you said, it's worth, a picture is worth a thousand words. And really, you could write a whole book about one picture if you yeah. really wanted to. Yeah, you know how and you, and, you know, when you look at these pictures like the, the Mona Lisa is another one where they've studied that over and over and they've noticed that, you know, everything from this side over is, is, is different sizing in the background than this picture, this than this side. This side, the background seems closer than that side, even though it's the behind the same person. That's one of the things that's obvious when you when you look at it. And but there's the, the hand gestures and the way she's holding her hand with her fingers. She's got, you know, her hands like this and that these two fingers fingers are out and the thumb is out you know that you, you can't see it on my camera because my camera's too high but they're like this that means something yeah. you know you have yeah. madonna on the rocks and it's the same thing madonna's fingers are in and it's very similar to that now that means something it all means something that those people who painted that knew that other people like them would interpret it and they were telling the stories because it was heresy to say some of the things they said exactly. uh, you yeah. know socrates was put to death for his being open-minded and and stating things uh he was forced to drink lilac and kill himself uh over, oh, many, many you know, people throughout yeah. history have been like that galileo was imprisoned and ended up killing himself because right. uh of his teachings giordano bruno he was put to death uh hypatia the famous uh female philosopher from greece she was murdered by a mob of people because she was teaching these various things you know uh over Time Look at history, the witch hunts people. in Salem. They talk about yeah, that in the Da Vinci Code, where they use the witch's hammer, the book that taught them how to shut up women who were free thinkers, and they told them they they, they called them witches and burned them at the stake. And yeah. you know, in the ways that they burned them, they said, "Look, if we toss you in the water and you and you float, you're a witch. But if we toss you in the water <laughs> and you sink, then you're not. But if you sank, then you drowned. And if you floated, yeah, it was because these... you you know, then they would kill you if you floated. So if you died." then they said they cleansed you of the witch so either way you were going to die right yeah yeah it was crazy you had, to, you had to code things and that's that's one of the reasons things were coded like that uh to pass on knowledge to people who knew without being labeled a heretic or put to death or whatever and then actually a lot of these painters who made these things they were commissioned by kings and and really rich people right. who knew stuff who wanted them to put that stuff in there for their own just right. because they thought it was cool or they wanted, you know. And then some of it was, was people who were commissioned to do that, like for the church, and they were putting stuff in that the church was unaware of, but the church yeah, didn't exactly. know. So when they saw the pictures like the, the you know, for instance, for the, the one for the, the Last Supper, they just went, oh, 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 it's, oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Yeah, and they had no idea what was being said in that picture. But the and, initiates to see that one little finger thing can say oh okay that he was he was trying to tell me something that was for that was for us for or for me, me or to us. know yep. so you can please the the people that are paying you to do it and not get put to death if you mess up one little we'll detail still tell a story but you can hide something from them and mm -hmm. keep that knowledge passed on forever through the symbolism yep you know so and that's, another another one is that is that uh um, that church, not Rosalind Chapel, but the one where the guy uh, supposedly found the information and went to Rome and came back rich, and then he built a temple uh, to uh, Mary Magdalene. And when you walked in, if you're Catholic, you know uh, you know you know what the Beatitudes are, um, and those are the stations of of the the life of Jesus and what he went through until his death and resurrection. And the, each one is a picture of course, symbolism, picture of that actual function of what was happening to him, including him being crucified. And then uh, when he was being uh, interned into the uh, tomb, 
And in that church, they found that when he renovated the church, uh, if you look at the picture that's on the Beatitude of them putting Jesus into the tomb uh, and you pay attention to it, all of a sudden you realize that when they put Jesus in the tomb, anywhere else you go in any Catholic church, it's daytime. And they're putting him into his tomb, laying him down and putting the what we know now is the Shroud of Turin over his body and putting oil on his body, preparing him for death. And then when you look at that one in that one particular church, it's in fact at night and there's a moon and stars and they're actually spiriting away Jesus's body. Stealing it from the tomb, not putting it in there. And he was trying to show people that the information that he found, supposedly, because we don't know for 100 percent. But wars have been fought over this because all the people in the south of France, not too long after that, were attacked by the Roman Catholic Church. And this is in the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which was one of the books that Dan Brown wrote his story on, that two million people in the south of France were slaughtered by the Roman Catholic Church because after that guy um, got that information to the people, they they had, in fact, uh, uh, prior to that, they realized that they had Mary Magdalene supposedly had went there with a the daughter and uh, lived their lives there. And she married into the Merovingian king bloodline. And um, so the so the descendants of Jesus's blood were in France. Yeah. So they started yeah. a religion there that said that the religion over there in Rome is wrong, corrupt and evil. And it's not what Jesus was preaching. And they preached the true religion, what they believed, and that everybody it was actually almost exactly what luther uh t- teaches in lutheranism that women can be priests and women can be and everybody can be married and and and, and everything that that is in lutheranism today is what they were teaching so they went there and murdered everybody who had anything yeah, to do with that, that church. was one of the biggest genocides in all of history i think those were the the cathars or the the cathars, cathars. It, it was, yeah, it was however the you cathars. want to say it but it was the yeah, it ties cathars into and, the, yes it was the descendant yeah, of the kings Yes. Yeah, they're the descendants of the bloodline, you know, supposedly some of them, and also they were teaching the mystery religions uh, kind of tied into Gnosticism and things like right. that, uh, right. saying that the, the religions being taught now are basically the uh, the surface layer, they're the, the demiurge or whatever, yeah, they're yeah. not the true teachings, they've twisted things and they're giving you an exoteric, you know, uh, twisted, corrupt version of things. Right, and we're, for money and power, you know, getting, yeah. Yeah, we're getting to the core of things and, and teaching you the truth. And the God that they're worshiping or trying to get you to wor- worship is actually the one that's trying to control you. They're trying to make you fear God and, and all this kind of stuff when really God's supposed to be loving. And Jesus was saying we can all be gods and, and ye are God, you know, all this stuff. That's why they took a lot of these books like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary. I actually found the Gospel of Mary Magdalene uh, at Goodwill just a couple months ago, and I bought it, and I've, I've read some of it, not all of it yet, but right. there's a lot of things in these ones that were taken out that you can clearly see why they were removed, because they right. didn't want you knowing. You know, the the mainstream Christian religion now wants you to think you have to fear God, you're never good enough to be God, you're a sinner, you're going to hell no matter what, you have to repent, accept Jesus, but the ones that they took out, they teach you, no, you are God, you're supposed to find God within yourself. This God, this Old Testament God, Yahweh, that they're trying to get you to worship is really the demiurge and, you know, the control right. system, and blah, blah. And the church is not going to be able to control a group of free thinkers who knows that they're trying to control them. So they have to give them a, a different version of things, uh, a few different purposes for control reasons, you know, and many other things. But basically to establish the Roman Empire and, you know, right. stop a... a a group of free thinkers from, you know, living on the world. And, like you said, trying to get rid of some of the bloodline, which is pretty controversial because a lot of people that get into research just Mm -hmm. don't want to accept that Jesus or Mary could actually be real people. You know, when you first get into esoteric research, one of the first things that you do is you you find out some of the things about the Bible that are allegory and metaphor, and it instantly makes you want to think, all the Bible's all crap. It's all lies, this and that. Right. So, so you don't want to believe. After that, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to believe anything's true. So you start yeah. to fall in this conspiracy mindset about it, you know, and you just don't want to believe that Jesus could be real at all. But right. really, what happened is, you know, they they made half truths out of things and they twisted stuff to make it so uh, so confusing, you know. Yep. So a mainstream Christian thinks that Jesus is a, a supernatural being. He was almost like a spirit ghost. God person, you right. know, right. when really the real teachings are is that he was basically just a, a Gnostic ascended master, a scene, whatever, and that Mary was also in a scene, yes. or a scene, however people uh, say it, you know, right. but uh, that's the real teachings is that 
Right. These people were of a royal bloodline. Right. They had all the, the mystery teachings they knew about. They were Gnostics, and they were not down for the control system and right. and all that stuff. You Absolutely. know, that's what they had to. And, that's what see, they had and, to do. And and what they did was at the Council of Nicaea. I know we're talking about religion now, but all this guys is the symbolism that we're talking about. And when you start to interpret and start to learn the symbolism anywhere, even if it's just in these paintings or cave drawings, what that does is to you, it opens up your mind to be able to start to see things that's happening and you will end up yep. seeing what we're talking about now. So we're not just talking about conspiracy theories because we're talking about religion. We're showing you the things they used using these tools to change their ideology. And in the Council of Nicaea, that was when they decided that they wanted to depict Jesus as a godlike figure. And they had to change a few things and throw out all the Gnostic ideology. They had to get rid of that because that kept him as a human being, like you were saying, that he was being painted as, as an Essene. And they had to take all of that and get rid of it because they could only keep the storylines in that made him be the word of God. They based all of Jesus being a god on it said that he was the word of God. So when God created the world, there was God. And then there was the word of God and the word of God spread. And so they said, Jesus was the word of God. So if Jesus is God's voice, then in effect, he's God. And that's when they created the Trinity with the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. You see, yeah. that's when they created the trilogy of the Trinity was utilizing that technique. And then they just threw everything else out and banned it. But people took those books and said, these are important. And they went and buried them in different places. And we've now found most of them. That's how we have the yeah. knowledge. That's and how see, we have now, knowledge. Now, just because it's been changed, too, it doesn't mean that nothing in the Bible is actually still good. Because even the right. stuff that's in the the King James or in the canonized Bible is actually very profound, yes. good information. And I too. tell it's people just, that when they ask me, do you think Jesus uh, lived or if Jesus didn't live, what does that change? And I say, it doesn't change anything because even if Jesus was a creation, the, the ideology and the message that they're trying to teach you is sound. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's, and that's what I tell people. The message is sound. The ideology of what Jesus is trying to say is the way you should live your life. So even if they yeah, made right. Jesus up, the storyline they made up is still something that, like you're saying, well, still something it's that's still based to. on. It's still based on the 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 uh, uh, mystery teachings and the you know the ancient philosophies and stuff. It's still all mixed in there. Yep. It's just that people get so stuck on the final conclusions or. Yep what one preacher interprets the things that, that they can't learn how to think for themselves, and that's where the symbolism and the deeper meanings and learning how to study symbolism and stuff comes into play because once you learn about symbolism and, uh, and all that stuff and you can learn how to see deeper meanings, yep. you, can, you can analyze everything with new eyes and you yeah. can see what's been edited, what's been taken out, or you know, even if you only read the King James and don't look at any of the removed text, you can still find the deeper meanings and see what is supposed to be extracted from there and not get caught up with the final conclusions of, okay, well, all this book is full of all this great stuff, but the end message is, accept Jesus or go to hell. Like, you know, that's, right. that's what... Well, see, here's another up. perfect example. Today I was talking to uh, Renee, the Born Intuitive, and, and uh, she said, we, we, we got to talking about um, uh, Jesus, and she said, you know, I, I thought that Jesus was tempted in the garden before the the night before that he was uh, 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 eventually arrested and then beaten and then crucified. But when you read the Bible, that it doesn't really get into much detail. It just sort of says that he was praying and that he was tempted by the devil. But yet I remember being told this long, big storyline of what went on in that temptation. And I said, you know, that's funny that you say that because that was part of the Gnostic um, stuff that was removed during the Council of yeah, Nicaea. Exactly. And the only place where they depict that is in the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, where Will Willem Dafoe plays Jesus, and the church officially says that is an unofficial story because they know it was based on one of the Gospels that were thrown out. But yep, yet, as a kid going to Christian schools, the, the priests and the pastors tell that story that is not in the Bible that they're holding in their hand. Yeah, and see, that that's also a big portion of why the paintings and the symbolism and stuff is important because... The, the Nag Hammadi and the Gnostic texts were really just rediscovered and brought to the public less than a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, uh, yeah. the people in the last few hundred years that only had access to the canonized version of things 
you know, they could look at these paintings and these pictures and start to understand some, you know, if you know how to interpret a picture and get a thousand words from a picture, you could basically look at a good enough painting based on the Gospel of Thomas or whatever, a section of the Gospel of Thomas, and get the fundamental message of that whole Gospel yep. Yep. based on that one picture. So yep. some of these things were made to get these teachings to people who would have no other way of finding that information right, on their because own. Most people didn't read and couldn't read. It's not like now where the majority of the population reads, right? Although that, although I think that's dec declining because nobody reads anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's on the internet and they all want a link. They, they can't even type in the link when you say, Hey, go check out this thing. They go, you got a link for that? Like, right. Use your fingers and go Google it, bro. Right. And you go to link for that? People only started to learn how to read really in the 1500s. I just watched a video not too long ago about it is, uh, when the British Empire really started expanding and you had the East India Trading Companies right. and the British Empires and all this and that, they started setting up education systems for people so that anywhere they sent a person in the whole world, they could do basic maths and, and talking and trading and things like that. That's right. only when education even started and they right. started teaching basic reading and writing and stuff like that. So up until the 1500s, the there was controlled really everything. Yeah. There was really no way to learn anything except for what the church, what the or, church or what, or what trade was passed you down to you, yeah. word of mouth. You know, if you get yeah. lucky and have somebody in your town that yep. uh, was descendant from somebody that came in and they never, they kept everything secret and you befriended them and they told right. you the secrets and hopefully you didn't tell the, the right. whoever. The, Hence the you know, Illuminati, they, right? The enlightened yeah, ones, yeah. right? I hope that they didn't snitch on you and get you murdered and all this stuff. So and that's why you had these societies that were underground that would teach different things. And religions had to go underground and do the same thing. And there was symbolism that was used to, to show if you were in the know where you could go to learn these things. And there would be different symbols they would show on a sign that said, oh, in here you can learn this stuff. This is where we meet. And, and so that was used even in those times. And, and if you didn't know what that symbol was, then you didn't know, and you didn't know, you weren't in the know, so you didn't know what, there was just a symbol that you saw that was mixed in with something. And they do that to this day when you look at different signs. Every company has their own symbol, Target, Walmart, Kmart. When I say yeah. those words to you, what comes to your mind? The word Walmart, but also the symbol for Walmart, right? Target mm -hmm. is a Target, right? Exactly. You know that? It's a bullseye. Yeah. Right? That's part of the whole thing is that Chevron, they want you to... If you go to Chevron, what do you see? You see a big shell. You see a Chevron, a shell. No, Chevron yeah. is a Chevron. Shell is the shell, right? You go to Exxon and you see the, the double cross making two X's, but it's actually yeah. the double Templar cross, um, which yeah. means something completely different than what you think it means. So there's yeah. symbolism in every company's name and every company's logo. That's why I made the comment about Orion Rising on my cover of my book with Orion being in the sky, the, the constellation of Orion being in the sky above the Giza Plateau. So there's symbolism in that. And those of you who know that, I instantly when I say that, you go, yeah, that makes sense. I get it because I understand it because I've learned it. Those of you who don't know, look it up and find out why I put the, the uh, Orion constellation in the sky directly above the, the Giza Plateau. And then yeah. once you do that, you'll go, what? And then when you read my book, you'll go, Wow, he's literally telling the story of his book on the front cover of his book, for anybody who knows. Yep, one picture is worth a thousand or a million words. Um, yep. That's, that's yep. basically the gist of it. I, I think we touched on pretty much the generic. Well, and we ran uh, and we ran over, buddy. I did, and I and I and I forgot to say something. He was only going to give us an hour because he's real busy. We actually went an hour and thirty three minutes. So I thank you. Oh yeah, <laughs> for, uh, for, I had fun. He's, he said he was he had some stuff he had to do tonight, and I didn't look at the clock until just now when he said that, and we're at an hour and thirty three minutes. I so, didn't either. So we were, we were so busy right? talking. We were so busy talking. We were only supposed to do an hour because Phil's Phil's busy. He's got a busy schedule. So we're going to reschedule, guys, uh, and Phil's going to come back and we'll, and we'll pick this up again and we'll talk about it again and maybe not maybe he'll want to talk about something else but he i know he was putting together stuff so you guys could see things he had images for you to so that we can see this so maybe we'll put that together maybe we'll talk about a different topic we'll figure out what phil wants to do but i think he wants to ring this out a little bit more um because there's some visuals that we can show you i know we were saying yeah, things yeah. different pictures but you didn't get to see them you know i mean i can come back multiple times and really it's up to you and what the people want to i mean if y'all the viewers want to actually get into some of the symbolism and want me to talk next time and maybe uh, have two or three pictures from each uh, era, you know, Egyptian, Greek, and, and 
uh, medieval paintings and stuff. If y'all would like for me to actually touch over some of the symbolism and help break down some of it, we could do a whole show based on that. Uh, I think with this one, we pretty much did a good overview of what symbolism is used for and, and how it interacts with the mind and all that, but we could do another show of actually breaking down some of the symbolism if the viewers would be interested in that, or we could come up with a whole new topic. I mean, I could talk about this for hours or anything else for hours. You seem like you're pretty well-educated on a variety of things, too, so I think right. we can have a conversation about anything, basically, but, uh, right. I mean, if the viewers are interested or if that sounds like a good thing to do next time, we can actually spend an hour or two, and I can have some graphics laid out and, you know, maybe spend 10 or 15 minutes on each picture actually discussing the symbolism and then kind of branch off from that a little bit or we right. can start a whole new topic either way yeah we'll just we'll just run with it we'll see what happens if it, you know if the people like it they'll show back up <laughs> right, right? Well, yeah so, i had a good time man. I, I appreciate having me on definitely this was a good talk and i i learned a lot of things too i didn't know so see good that's that's say we got it yeah i did too actually there was a lot of stuff that you said that i went what i didn't even know that and then so you know you learn something every day i hope to anyways that's one of the things that i try to pride myself on is at by the time i go to bed at night i I can look back on the day and say, you know what, I actually learned something today I didn't know. And if I can do that every single day of my life, then I, I feel that I'm benefiting myself. And in doing so, yep. if I can then, like talking to you and talking to these people, if you and I just saying things that we said, got, got some people interested and went, and they went, wow, I didn't know that. Then they learned something new and we're helping. We're helping each other learn new things, which means we're helping our society, which means we're helping yeah, our exactly. race of people. And that's what it's all about, right? And so, so if we all educate one another, because if you once you learn this and you guys see me harping a lot about politics and you see some of the other guys that we have on here we harp about politics the problem is that what you guys don't know is that we've gone through all this like phil has like i have like you know we had travis smith on here we see what's going on and we see what they're what you don't see the sleight of hand that you don't see and we're trying to and we you know sometimes we get angry and we're like guys you got to look at the big picture and see what's going on because we understand because like he, like phil said once you start down this rabbit hole there's no going back because you can't unlearn this stuff once you open your mind up to see these things then you see them everywhere and, yeah, and, and they become like be ghosts able. because they're real they're not like ghosts but they become like ghosts they start popping up and you go wow did i just see that was that just wait a minute rewind that and you rewind it and you go whoa they meant to put that in there and you go sneaky bastards and then you move on and you see things that you didn't notice before and then yeah, your whole that. mind opens up to a completely different place and then the politicians come on tv and start flinging poo at each other and you right. go and you see how cartoonish it is and then you go oh my god they all have an agenda and and they're lying. exactly they're all lying a, and none of them care about me <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole vedic concept hindu vedic concept called Maya, uh, it, it translates loosely to illusion. Now, there's, right. it gets deeper, and some people say that, no, it really doesn't mean that, but that's what most people interpret it as. It's, it's illusion. It's called Maya. It's the material world. It's the surface level of things, and really that's why I like getting into symbolism and helping people with it, too, is because once you can read deeper into things and, and see what's beyond the surface, you start to lift this veil, you know, that's what lifting the veil or, or piercing the veil of Maya is about because once you lift that veil, the covering that's been over everything, your your mind and your programming from your whole life, and you can lift this and start to see some of these deeper things and learn how to uh, use your intuition and, and see what's been hidden and, and covered up, you just won't be able to be lied to anymore. You know, right. you start seeing all this stuff and somebody lies to you and tries to tell you about something you you're going to be like, you start yeah, to recognize like, hey, what they're doing. Well, yeah. do that. Yep. You know, and you just can't be lied to anymore. So it's not even just about, oh, the cross means this and this, and then the Babylonians use it. That's and the then basics the that get you to it. the next level, right? Yeah, it's learning how to yeah. understand how everything connects and uh, getting away from division and separation and illusions and getting to the core of things. That way you can perceive the truth for yourself and not be lied to and have all these things like now anybody right. that listened to this that learned about how symbols are used in marketing and colors and stuff right now everybody's going to go into walmart or whatever yep. and see blue or see red on an advertisement and be like i know exactly why they're using that color now right. you would have never thought well, about the same that thing when remember, you look at the president or you look at the people in the in the you know in, in there like when the president was came out just yesterday and he was talking to the president of finland he was wearing a black suit white shirt red power tie 
because he wanted everybody. He was hard line on what he was talking about. Other times you'll see them try to come out and be more, um, you know, more relaxed and kind of more like the daddy. And uh, Bush Jr. was famous for that. He'd come out wearing a blue tie or a pastel blue tie. Exactly. And he would come out with a lighter colored suit instead of the dark, ominous, uh, you know, hardliner suit. And he would talk and he would have a different demeanor. Barack Obama was famous for that. If you watch the way Barack Obama dressed and the different color ties he wore. And then sometimes he would come out without a shirt, without a, a jacket on, right, guys? And he would stand there and he would talk. But when he was being hardline and he was with the rhetoric and going with this, he was wearing a red power tie. We, exactly. people, in, people in the industry, I, I used to wear a tie every day of my life and a suit. And you, you learn this because when you're in uh, any kind of corporation or any kind of management, your tie tells a story of who you are and what you're about whether you're a lackadaisical or whether you're a team player or whether you're a pirate or whatnot in yeah. the world of of uh industry where people wear not you know where there's white collar not blue collar but white collar so so you have to do this. So when you look at the guys that are on the news, those guys that are on the news are wearing different colors. They're dressed because they have to be professional and they have the leniency because they're a, a news guy. They can, a reporter, they can wear different colored ties. You see them with salmon colored and yellow and blue. And, and some of them wear them depending on whether it's like, you see the guys wearing pink ties uh, in, the, in the football and in the sports arena because you have like that month that's uh, cancer awareness. They'll all wear pink ties or they'll wear pink shoes or they'll have a pink, you know. So there's the symbolism of the colors there that we use yeah. right yeah it's just multi-layered you know but once you start to just learn the generic uses for it in general then you can start to you know get to the deeper levels and it just yeah. goes infinitely deeper and deeper but you know the the main part is just that breaking that surface layer and even right. just knowing that it's being used at all you would never normally think symbols and advertisement and stuff is doing that but once you just know it all you can start to get deeper and deeper and, well, and, and that's just like with the on. swastika you start to realize then that the swastika has been on this planet for a hundred thousand years and up until the 40s 1940s it was not an evil symbol now it's it's the symbol of nazism and racism and hatred the same thing yeah. with the uh, with the flag in the south that flag was there long before that whole idea was and it wasn't about slavery but now it's being demonized and that's why you yeah. have people that are on both sides of that and you know i don't like the whole erasing our, our history i think we need to keep it so we don't so we don't end up repeating it. So I think some of the history should be kept, but I do agree that some of those statues are a little racy and they might need to come down. So I try to stay on the fence about that. And I'm just going to let that play out in the courts. Well, and find out where a, it's, you know. at least be maybe a democratic vote on whether they're going to be. That's what I'm remote. saying. I think it should be more, you know, I think the people should vote on it. And I think the people who uh, live there, not all the rest of the, like, I don't think the country should dictate what, a state does. I think the people in that state, they're the ones that are affected by it. I think really that they should do that. And the reason I say that, and everybody's going to hate me for this because they're going to go, well, everybody in the South's going to, of course they're going to vote for it. You don't really know that. You don't really know that. Okay. But I don't like the federal government dictating to the individual what they can and can't do. Okay. I don't like that. So if you give the power to the federal government, they're going to take it because you're giving yeah, it to exactly. them. And the next thing you know, they're going to be telling you what you can and can't wear and when you can and can't breed and where you can and can't go. Okay. So that's a, that's in my opinion, that's a power that you're giving to, to somebody that you don't need to give to. So I think that states should dictate that. And if it bothers you, don't go there, move away. It's just like if you're watching television and it bothers you, change the channel, right? Everyone has the right to have that stuff there. So if you don't like it, you know, you can't say, I want to have my show on TV about gay rights, but you can't, say that you're pr proud to be white but i can have uh, a bet entertainment and i can have uh, black pride all i want in black history month but don't you try it whitey because i'm gonna you're gonna have a hood and you're a racist well that's, see if see that's i don't like that that's like counter racism I, I i don't like that that you can have something and you say you can have something uh, and in in but i can't do the same thing well if, pe if people knew see the thing is if people knew that their reaction to the statue was a programmed reaction to begin with based right. on what the media had been showing or Absolutely. what school told see, about slavery and stuff. And that's see, my people point are making, because... having reactions to something based on what they don't even really know about what it them. was. Because the media on both sides 
are telling you lies and getting you upset about and and if you watch one show then you will become slanted to their to what they're telling you to hate and that ties if you into watch the, symbolism you know, and yes, marketing because, symbolism yes. programming because they're telling you what to hate and they're telling you when to hate it yeah. and if you turn just it like off yeah if yeah you turn it just off, like i was saying that they used to the symbols and the colors and all that are used to interact with your subconscious mind all this stuff the media is like the the symbol uh, yep. mega whatever you know that's right. like the ruler and of here's all here's the perfect they example of what and, Phil's talking about perfect example when you're watching any news station whenever there's breaking news what color is the words breaking news always printed in on the screen red red yeah red. always red. breaking news always red think about it makes that. you instantly heart pump a little bit your eyes widen a little bit you become more receptive and more ready to get angry or you know it's it's all you get on the Mass edge. Tell me what I'm supposed to do from here. I'm on the edge now. So. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. And they get you on the edge, and then they and then they tell you what to either what to hate or what to be mad at, right? Yeah. Or, you know, like if the letters were in blue, even even without you knowing, if you were even a kid or whatever, if you saw breaking news in blue, your subconscious reaction would be that maybe it's probably going to be some good, nice news good about news. to come up. But when you see breaking news in red and big flash. Just your instinctual nature is going to be doom, doom, doom. Oh, there's something, something bad. bad to be something told. major right. has coming. And then True. whatever they insert True. into that little 30 second period just completely brainwashes you and, and yep. slants you to that side. But once Absolutely. you can lift that veil and know that that's what they're doing to you, you will not be as affected no, by exactly manipulation. Because you'll be able to fight it because you'll know what they're doing and you'll go, oh, here we go. What are they going to tell me now? And then when they do, you go, knew it. And then, then you're going to break your 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 conditioning that they're th the movies do it. They have product placement in movies yeah. where where no. they they make sure that you see the product that has paid money to be in that show, but you don't exactly. notice it. You're not paying attention to it, but you but you can see the label and see the name. If you don't see the label and don't see the name, it's because nobody paid for that, and so they have something generic there, right? But if yeah. you did, if you do, and that guy pulls out a pack of Lucky Strikes, you're going to see the word Lucky Strikes, or you're going to see the entire pack, exactly. right? But if not, exactly. he's going to pull his hand out like this and pull a cigarette out and light it because nobody paid to have that cigarette in the scene. Okay, exactly. so he's going to block the cigarette and you're not going to see the label or it's going to look similar to Marlboro. They love to do that. You notice that? They love to similar to Marlboro or you'll see a camel, but oh, they yeah. won't see the pyramids or, you know, something. So they, they do all of that happens and it conditions your brain. So this is what we're talking about. So when, I, when I'm talking about politics is because I see what's happening and none of them care about you. They don't care about me. All they care about is money and power and they're slanting your mind to believe it. And that's why I want to get that picture from, uh, from uh, Travis. He had a picture of Adolf Hitler and Adolf Adolf Hitler said it was a quote. If you want to get people to believe something, tell them a lie. Make it big, tell it often, and people will believe it. Yep, exactly. And that's and, what they're uh, doing on the news, on all those channels. You have to look through what they're saying to find out what they're really doing. And that's yep. what we talked about with Travis the other night and what Phil's talking about. But you have to go back to the basics of, and that's why we took you back to the beginning, to the basics of the paintings and the pictures, because it started there. We're, we're prone to that when we're born. Like I said in the beginning, we see the human face first. We see images first. That's how we learn. We learn imagery, and then we plug something to the word. So even if consciously we don't get it, subconsciously we do. And we exactly. learn that stuff. Uh, my my uh, my stepson, we had his placemat when he was a kid, and it was the periodic table of elements. And that was what he ate his dinner on every single night from the time he was three years old until until I think he was a teenager. Okay, And his grandfather bought it and said he doesn't understand it, but he's going to get it in his brain through osmosis. Okay, <laughs> Look up what that word means. It's there in front of him constantly, and he sees it constantly. And your brain records that. Every time you look down at your food, your brain is recording whether you know it. The, and that's how you learn how to type and not have to look down. Your brain learns where the buttons are and which button is there. And your fingers can go to those buttons automatically because your brain knows they're there. You learned that keyboard through osmosis. It got into your yeah, brain that's... over and over by you seeing it. And now you don't have to think about it. Same thing with the pictures. They show you pictures over and over and you learn it and you don't have to think about it. So they do the same thing on a grander scale. They used to do that, what they call the subliminal messaging, where they would show you that and they would be watching a movie and they would cut in one frame of popcorn and then, and then they'd let the movie run for uh, 10 seconds and one frame of a Coke and they'll let the movie run. And your brain would pick that up and you'd want to go buy popcorn. This is true. Everybody, half the people would get up and go buy a popcorn in a drink. Yep. And they, they, uh, the, the, uh, here in the United States, 
United States, they found out they were doing that, so they made it illegal. So now what they do is they have product placement. Even if you mute your television, you can tell what the commercial's about because the product is going to be put on the screen right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. Or they know that in a, in a theater, people sitting there, after about one hour, people start getting thirsty. So the, in the movie or whatever, a person might... You take a big swig take a of big a drink. Swig of a drink. Ah, and that's they'll make sure. Noise, so. And they, here's the thing too: they'll make sure it's a it's a part of the movie that they've purposely made so that you could leave and come back and not miss anything. It'll be a <laughs> lull in the movie. It's genius, really. It's genius, it's but it's, it's they're preying on the hearts of people. And I'll I'll leave with this: uh, I got lucky when I was probably six or seven years old. My grandma, I was, used to go to my grandma's house a lot, and they had a. Uh, book or a box of books in their closet yard sale books and stuff that you know they had acquired over the years and I remember this very good it was a, a book on marketing and it was made kind of like a cartoon character book like a mad comics type of you know book or whatever to it was actually using symbolism and marketing to teach you about marketing strategies mm -hmm. and I was it, it was written good enough to where me even being a kid like that I read it and they were showing you how they use these tactics to program your subconscious mind and to use colors and words and different things and that they were doing. you were actually doing. able to pick it up even then, right? Yeah, and I, and I read it, and I was like, can this even be possible? Is it, so, I mean, I, <laughs> even just through the process of the, the way that it works, the subconscious, even though I didn't know to really start looking for that in the, in the TV and stuff, by reading that book and that, that marketing strategy that that book was written with, that taught me to look for marketing strategies. I started mm -hmm. noticing it subconsciously, and now, you know, 25 years later, I'm here being able to look back at that book and realize how it led me to be able to start seeing this stuff. And I can understand now why I haven't been as susceptible, and I never really watched the TV. And you know, right. when I do, it kind of when I did used to watch the TV, I always kind of cringed and wanted to get away from it instead of being drawn to it because I knew they were tricking me. But yep. if I never would have known they were tricking me, I would have been glued to you it. Glued and when they it. showed me, a, so when they showed me a picture of somebody knocking down a statue, I would have been, oh, them damn, and I would have been mad. Yeah, get them. I yeah. would have went to the grocery store and saw a black person and been angry or whatever. You know what I mean? They would have completely molded my whole personality and my actions by what they show on a news clip. You yep. know, and that's that's symbolism, that's marketing, that's yep. programming. And I, have that's, a, I have a picture, uh, real quick before we go, I have a picture where it's a news guy sitting at a desk, and it's one of those I got offline, and the, and, the, and the body down here, it says, up next we will tell you who to hate and when. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's basically what it boils down to also. They just don't tell you that's what they're doing. Right, but that's what so it that's... is, right? That's what it is. <laughs> Up next, yeah, right after this commercial break, we're going to get back into Obama bashing, and that's the way it was the whole time he was in charge. Now it's after this commercial break, more on how Trump is the devil and unfit to be the president. <laughs> right, that's what they do, man. Yeah. That's all they do. Hey, this is a good they got, this is a good they talk, got on man. him. They got on him. No matter what. Now, like when the when the when the, uh, the storm hit. Now, if he'd have gone down there the day of the storm, they would have said, "Oh, he was here too early." And if he'd have gone down two days later, he was too late. So he went down there on day four, and they said he was too early. And I was like, so it didn't matter what he did. They were going to say yeah. it was either too early or too late and criticize him. He was way over yeah. there in Corpus Christi, man. He doesn't know what's <laughs> going on in Houston. You know, that was just like, what? So you guys want him to go over where the water is and get the waist deep or neck deep just so you can. Then you'll go look at him. He's he's doing all that just to promote himself. So it didn't matter. Yeah. There's going to be negative <laughs> rhetoric <laughs> because they hate him. It's an agenda. That's what you they, special. That's what that. they yeah. specialize in. Yeah. So it's just funny. I kind of laugh, but I, I laugh, but at the same time, I cringe, like you said, because I know it's working on the masses, and that's why we're here. We're trying to tell you guys, wake up and see what's being done to you because you're being programmed, and you have to break that conditioning to see what's really going on. And that goes back to the whole alien thing. You're being programmed to be afraid of aliens and told that aliens don't exist and to be afraid of them, but they really are here, and you don't need to be afraid of most of them, but there are some that you probably should be afraid of. But we sound like we're cuckoo and then when you start to learn this stuff you'll come forward and all of a sudden one day you'll have an epiphany and you'll go wow all of that was true and then you'll blow your mind you won't know what to do you'll get real angry we all go through that then you get real angry at the world you get angry at the governments for lying to you and then at some point you come back around like neil gore said from uh, portal to ascension you spend the time being angry and what we're trying to do is teach you so that you get fast-tracked past this stuff so that you see it 
faster than we did because we had to live it and we had to be angry for a while. And now we're laughing. I mean, look at Phil and I, we're laughing about this stuff, right? Because it's laughable, but you guys are getting angry about it and knocking statues down. He and I are going, oh man, it's like watching the WWE. What's next? Right. And that's terrible because you guys are really passionate about it. And the reason you are is because they told you to be. And we we're we're broken. Our conditioning is broken. And we're looking at it going, we need to help these people to get out of this because they're just getting bad. All right. So we're still running over, Phil. I'm sorry. We're almost to two hours now. So I'm going to I'm going to call the show because uh, Phil said one hour and we're at one hour and 54 minutes because we just kept jabbering on. So thank you. Thank you as always, buddy, for uh, yeah. for, for being here. And um, we'll reschedule. We'll get you here next week sometime. Uh, we'll look at your schedule, my schedule. We'll get you back on here, and we'll pick this back up. Yeah, we can we can get on the same topic again, or we can move on to something else, or just just whatever, whatever you know. We'll figure, we'll it depends some, on what's going on we'll in the world, some, maybe, right? Maybe there'll be we'll something bigger. Some maybe we'll be bombing uh, uh, Korea at the time, and we'll be able to talk about that and and why. Right. Like, and if you guys don't know, I said this. I made this reference the other day, and I and I say this again, uh, and I'll say this and look this up. Korea. Now, think about that. Think about what's going on over there. Now, look up the movie or the book, The Mouse That Roared. Never heard of it. No. The Mouse That Roared was a country, a small country. It was a, it was a movie with uh, a comedian. It was a comedy. It was a small country who declared war on America because they were poor, and they wanted America to come over and blow them up to give them money to rebuild their whole country. Because they would, be, they would be worth more money once America kicked their butt. Because America comes into a country, blows it to hell, knocks down all your old buildings, then builds all brand new ones for you, leaves all their military equipment for you, and leaves. Because <laughs> that's traditionally what that's America about, does. That's about how it works. So, so Korea's over there waving their fist at us because there's like 47 people in the whole country, and they're all out there marching the goose step. Right. And one bomb will blow them all to hell and they'd be all, oh, no, what do we do now? I don't know. You're a parking lot. So they really think that they're going to like uh, we're going to allow them to get to the point where they can blow us up before we stop them. Anybody who has that mindset is a mouse that roared. Those people want us to blow them up so that we can rebuild them so they become richer. All right. Otherwise, the man is just nuts and we need to put a bullet right here in his skull and let it come out this side. Right. And then he just falls over. Problem solved. Whatever. Anyway, it's laughable, okay, guys? He just wants money. He wants a ransom of $100, $100 million to stop doing what he's doing. All right, so, uh, Phil, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this back up. Or, like I said, there's going to be something else going on, and we'll be over here. Look, what, look what's going on over here. And we can show people that that's going on next week or the week after. All right, guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for you guys who, uh, who tuned into the show. Uh, anybody who's still with us and, and those of you who will find this show, um, if you want to look for it, it's going to be uh, on my YouTube page. I'll have it archived there. It'll also be archived on Orion Rising, the page on Facebook. It'll also be podcast. I'll have that up in the next couple of days. It'll be podcast everywhere. iTunes, Podcast Bean, Podcast Addict, uh, Twitter, YouTube. Um, you name the place where there's a podcast and my show's going to be podcast there. And if it's not, tell me and I'll get it up there. All right. So if you don't have time to watch the video, you can watch it on any of those, listen to it on any of those places. And if you want to watch the video, it'll be on YouTube under my name, Leonard O'Neill, or it'll be archived in uh, Facebook at Orion Rising the page because i have orion rising worldwide which is a group but the page orion rising and uh just google it man you'll find me i'm everywhere you'll either find my book or the link to my book or the link to my facebook page either way orion rising look it up and that's where this and all the other shows are archived so go there like that page because you'll get notifications when i go live also do the same thing on youtube so when i post the videos and i post the podcasts on youtube you'll get that notification so in case you can't watch my show but you really want to listen to it while you're driving to work or back from work bingo podcast enjoy all right go to go there and like like my youtube page and share it with your friends subscribe to it like it and share it to your with your friends same thing with itunes go to itunes like me on itunes uh, uh, because you'll get my podcast all right phil thank you again for being here buddy um yeah great and great. Uh, like i said to everybody yeah, else thank you so uh and we will uh, i'll be live again tomorrow i have a show tomorrow with heather uh Heather Reese is going to be on here tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific time. She is a medium who talks to her spirit guides, and she has written several books by using auto writing. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Google it. I don't have a link for you. Google it. Um, or use whatever you like, Yahoo or whatever you like. Uh, look up auto writing. She wrote a book. We're going to talk about it tomorrow night, tomorrow evening. So tune in. Be there. Be square. Yeah. Right? Hey, and just on the way out, just to all the viewers, uh I spend a lot of my free time, you know, talking to people and answering questions, and I, I have no problem with anybody adding me and messaging me anytime. If I can't get to you immediately, I'll respond as soon as possible. I really try to 
help people as much as I can and spread information. So feel free, if, if you like this information, to add me on Facebook, Phil Harris, look up my YouTube channel, or join my research group, Ancient Esoteric and Occult Wisdom. And the picture that you see right here on the screen, right below Phil, is his icon picture that he uses, his avatar picture. I took that right off your page, uh, the one that awesome. you in the the one that you view in the car that you have on your page. I took that, and that's what yep. they're seeing here. So when you type in okay, his name, yep. when you type in his name, looking for him, you'll see that picture, the one that's right down below, in the middle over here, at that direction, yeah, right down over there. <laughs> that's yeah, what you'll see. Yeah, a friend and just. Look at my page or, you know, follow my post or you can message me and ask me questions if you want or share any interesting information you have related to this subject or uh, I can guide you to some of the groups I'm in, just whatever. I'm here to, you know, help humanity and help everybody here and uh, try to spread information and, you know, do what, I, do what I'm here on this planet for. So right. thanks for having me here. I, I really enjoy what you're doing and I'm, I'm glad that you're here with us too and, and helping do your part and the global awakening, as they call it. So, right. thanks so much. Right? Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get that we'll get that going for the world here, and we'll have definitely have global awakening, and and we'll get you know the disclosure. We're only going to be able to do it ourselves, guys. <clears throat> the government's not going to come out and tell us any of that. No government's going to come out and tell us that. We're going to have to figure it out for ourselves. The only way we can do that is is through what we're talking about here. Learn learn the symbolism, learn the symbology, move forward from there, and ascend to a higher place. That way, you can get your mind into a place where you see what's going on, and then you'll see that. Um, we need to uh, meditate more and, and vibrate at a higher rate. And when we get you to that point, you can communicate with your mind. And once you do that, you can talk to these uh, these aliens that you don't right now believe in, but that uh, some of us are doing that. So um, you'll see in the next few years that that's going to happen. And the more of us who, who do this, the more of us who understand this, the quicker it's going to happen as a race of people and the faster that we're going to have peace and the faster that we're going to be able to save our planet before it gets to the point of no return, which I, I believe we will save before it gets to the point of no return. So um, I'm just... Just trying to say that it's it would be better if it happened faster we're moving into that era we're moving into the next era we're moving into Bakhtun 13 we're moving into the new era for the new life that's supposed to be the beginning of the next 6,500 year whatever it is uh, a stage or 3,500 whatever whatever it is that the Mayans and the Incans and the Aztecs talked about um, but we're in the beginning right there in the middle now yeah. You know, the right. Yuga, the Yuga cycles or yes. the Zodiac ages, Yuga yep. cycles, all that stuff. Yep. Uh, we're right in the beginning of here. a new one, right? And it's and, definitely here, and we're in a we're in, in my opinion, the, the biggest transition, transition phase, phase yes. in our known history. Yes, I mean, absolutely. what happened? Absolutely what happened before is. the flood, or what happened before 4,000 BC? When you yeah. know, we don't really know what happened before the Sumerians and stuff. You know, so right. definitely in the last 6,000 years, this is the biggest, biggest turning transition. point, but yep. possibly. Possibly the biggest turning point in the last about 12,000 years or yeah. so. So uh, yeah. this is so a really major time. Don't be afraid, guys. Don't be scared. They're trying to make you scared. If you watch the news, they're trying to make you afraid of each other. We're trying to make you afraid of a color of a guy's skin. What happens to me? I'm polka dotted. <laughs> Where do I fit in? I'm, I'm black, white, brown, Chinese, and white, all in the same body. What the hell? Who am I supposed to do? I'm going to be the first one sacrifice probably right get him he's the one that's weird he's different than all of us we can't tell what he is kill him first then we'll go after everybody else <laughs> all right guys <laughs> great show yeah man nice talking right. to you again have, thanks have thanks everybody thanks everybody for being here and we'll, and we'll talk later all right so here let me let me take all us right. off air here